Woo, we live. We are live. Let's do this. Welcome back. It's great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you got the, uh, actually, no, the, well, now you're start. you went, you had the full Amish, and now you got a little mustache growing in. Yeah, the stash is growing back. I got, I'll whack it back. And, and it's, it's kind it's funny, but it's like, um, it's kind of Moby Dick, Moses, Amish. Yeah. You're, I'm yeah, for, you're. I'm going for you're, the quad. You're melding cultures because we had th this was the original image, uh -huh. and then <laughs> uh, I went with the Amish version. Yeah, yeah. So, no, it's awesome. cool. It was, you know, it was funny because, like, when I look at the pictures of my ancestors in New England, we all look like this, right? They're all sea seafarers, but um, a lot of it was just. You know, anytime you go to another country with a different culture, the the idea of bending to the culture is always a healthy practice, in my opinion. That what you're trying to say is that you know I'm I'm here to meet you halfway, and so what I realized was that uh, facial hair was a, a cultural norm, and so I grew it out. But it's funny because like I mean I've been growing a beard since I was like 14. But it never, ever got long. It turned into like the most steel wool, bristly, rough looking beard ever. Right. So I never I never, ever grew them out in duration. But it's funny as I got old and my hair turned white, this shit started to get long. Right. And I'm laughing because now I'm trying to figure out how long can I grow it? <laughs> my family's like, what the fuck? <laughs> they're like, please don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're begging me not to. But I'm just fascinated by it. And um. It was uh, it was just an incredible experience. I can't wait to talk about the trip. Well, we we're live now, and um, yeah, there are tons of people who are 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 watching and are really interested in this trip. Um, where exactly did you go? I went to Pakistan. So the uh, there was uh, two groups combined, and it's Let's Be Friends Pakistan, which is a like a tourism based business where they're trying to bring attention back to Pakistan and get people to come and visit the country, meet the people. And then land race genetics, which is a, a gene company. And so uh, both of them kind of tied together and created this junket where they invited a bunch of us out so that we could, you know, experience Pakistan in, in a, in a really interesting manner and also get to take a look at the genes and, start to maybe work collaboratively on their 2023 selection. And it was, it was incredible because like, I mean, there's like a big story around it, but the, the, the interesting part is that the Silk Route, which we traveled, we really traveled the Silk Route, the Silk Route or the Silk Road, before it was called the Silk Route or the Silk Road, it was really this pathway from Asia over to Africa. And it was, and then into Europe. And what it was, was it was where the, the Neanderthals from Europe and the first hominid humans from Africa, they traveled along these routes to, to deal with drought and cold. And eventually they, they merged. And it's really where humanity starts to touch. The Neanderthal and the, the first humans touch along this path. And then you go forward into, you know, right around Christ era and you have uh, the Chinese, which figured out how to make silk and they kept it proprietary. So they held the secret back. No one knew how to milk the silkworm. And so they create this incredible product. And they also have spices and all these technological wonders that they're creating because their civilization was further ahead than the Europeans. And so the Roman gold desires Chinese goods. And it starts to create this back and forth. But the funny thing is, is that when you travel on this route, it's so huge that no one ever traveled the entire distance. And it's where the word middleman comes from. Middleman comes from the people who move the product from spot to spot in the middle. And every country that touched that route realized that they could benefit. So it really started to create incredible trade. And it wasn't really until Genghis Khan took over and stabilized it, that it became this incredible pipeline of product. And as you go forward over time, China sends paper and gunpowder to Europe, which changes the, the universe because now you have something to document your inventory and you have uh, gunpowder to create weapons. And so this, this Silk Route is exploding. 
you get into the Byzantium Empire and they send thieves over to China to steal the silkworm technology. They come back with the silkworm technology, take away China's competitive advantage. And when the Ottoman Empire takes over, which is Turkey, around 1500, they or, you know, that late 1400s, it seals off the Silk Route, which is what begins the European Ocean quest for spice and goods. So Columbus leaves Spain to go and around the world to go and recreate the Silk Route through ocean because he couldn't do it overland and he gets lost because he's a shitty sailor and he ends up in North America and he thinks he's in India and he names all the locals Indians. But that entire sea quest and development was all a result of the Silk Route getting knocked out in the late 1400s from the Ottomans. So the, 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 the Let's Be Friends Pakistan and the Land Race Group, they were like, hey, let's recreate the Silk Route. And it, it's, a, it's a common trend among a lot of the, um, I would say, genetic groups that are you know, gathering genetics from India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And it's the idea of trying to create relationships between the operators around the world. And the part that really drove this thing home for me was that there's an individual in Humboldt named Doug Fur, And Doug Fur is credited as the first individual to bring Kush genetics to North America. And so he went to Pakistan in the mid-70s, gathered seeds from the Tira Valley, sewed them in his, uh, you know, um, cuff of his shirt, you know, cuff of his pants, brings them back to Humboldt, and it kickstarts the broadleaf revolution which then kickstarts Humboldt, which kickstarts California, which kickstarts the United States. And so the university reached out to me because there's this legacy project that the university, uh, Cal Poly Humboldt, created with uh, the support of a guy named uh, Dr. Dominic Corva. And so Dominic is the head of the Cannabis Interdisciplinary Program. And him and a bunch of other individuals work to say, let's let's map and create the history of cannabis in Northern California, Humboldt County, so that we don't lose the story and the legacy of people who created this modern industry. And so when they, and I, I've known Doug for years, but I just didn't put the pieces together that I'm going to Pakistan, Doug was in Pakistan. So the university hits me up with Doug and we have a conversation about, hey, this is where I got the genes from what we're trying to do is DNA analysis to map any genes that are existing in Humboldt today to see are any of these plants today derivatives of the original stock. And then he sent me the map and the description of what the stock looked like that he gathered, what the seeds look like, and where exactly he gathered the stock. So I get this map. And so I'm going there to be able to, you know, get an experience to understand Pakistan and the region. I'm, I'm going there to work with Land Race Genetics to be able to do a 2023 collection with them. But the Silk Route is what really caught me because the idea with Silk Route was reciprocity. Reciprocity meaning that when the Chinese sent silk, the Romans sent gold. And, and Doug didn't do anything wrong. Doug gathered stock and brought it. But the Pakistanis never really benefited from the fact that the genes that left Pakistan developed a $20 billion U.S. industry. And so what we wanted to do was recreate the path of Doug Fur and go to the Tira Valley and gather genes so that we can bring them back, so that we can DNA them, so we can start to say, hey, does any of these genes still exist in a relatable form? And also to bring attention to this this you know, international relationship that cannabis cultivators need to develop because at the end of the day, all craft cultivators, in my opinion, are the same. We're all under a, a, a different weight. And because we're isolated country to country, we're not able to really support each other correctly. And so when I when I brought this up to Let's Be Friends Pakistan and Land Race, they were just like, whoa, let's, let's create the trail of Doug Fur. And so what we do is we, we fly in and uh, they had us fly into Dubai because I'd never been to Dubai. So they flew us into Dubai and they gave us like an eight hour layer over in Dubai. And we got picked up by a, a cat named, I think, Faisal. And he took us around Dubai so we could see the most like technologically advanced city being created. It was mind bending to see, you know, the world's tallest building, the picture frame buildings. Everywhere you went, almost like 
pristine. I mean, zero crime. But it was like being in Tampa, Florida in August. It was the hottest, most humid place I'd ever been in. If you're not inside in air conditioning, Dubai is savage. But it's unbelievably beautiful. And so Emirates Airline is what we flew in on. Emirates Airline is sponsored by Dubai. So if anybody's ever traveling and you want the nicest airline you've ever seen in your life, go to Emirates. Silverware, free. And I'm not a drinker, but free drinks the whole flight. A heated toilet hot water in the bathroom, <laughs> you know, big screen on, this is regular coach. Regular coach is like business on most airlines. And it was the 380E, which is that double decker. And for like three grand, I asked them that you can get a, a cabin on the second floor, your own like private bedroom. And wow. so Emirates creates a far better experience because they're sponsored by Dubai and they use the airline as like an advertisement for the country. So we all fly out. And what, what they did was they got a group of us together that they named the internationals, right? So when we showed up, in order to define us from the other p members in the group, they were like, we're the internationals. And we thought that shit was hysterical because it sounds better than foreigners. <laughs> and so we're the internationals. And it was Danny from Green Walrus, Ralph and John. And Ralph and John are um, uh, you know, videographers, filmmakers. And so they came with Danny. We had uh, a cat named Jamie out of London. We had Neil from London, who is involved with Australian cannabis, and a, an extractor from Canada named Imran, who's half Pakistani, half Scotch. And we all got together to go on this trip. So there was seven of us and then 13 of the members of Land Race Genetics and Let's Be Friends Pakistan. And so we fly in, we get into uh, Islamabad, and as soon as we get into the airport, we get out in the rig and they break out weed, right? And so I'm like, hey, we got grass. And they said, no, we got you a pound and a half of indoor and a half a key of hash. So we get in the rig and we got a half a key of 500 grams of killer hash from, from Tira Valley. And we have six quarter pounds of indoor. So one of the guys has an indoor in Pakistan that's pumping out herb <laughs> equivalent to anything coming out of California. It was hysterical. Because you're sitting in, it wasn't what I expected, right? Because they don't smoke herb in, in these countries because it's so dry. So herb just crumbles, hashes the way they've always historically preserved and used the resin. So we get in, in the airport, they greet us, you, you know, we all get beautiful uh, rose lays and stuff. And it's just really warm welcome. We get out to the rigs and instantly we get into the herb and the hash. And so I'm like, holy shit, this is going to be a party. And we start blazing. And we go to a, a beautiful townhouse in Islamabad and we get to hang out with some of the, the land race team and the Let's Be Friends team. And two of the guys on the land race on the Let's Be Friends Pakistan team were architects. And so they were kind of helping us understand the story and history of Islamabad, which is like one of the first engineered cities where all the streets make sense. The parks make sense. Just incredibly organized. And we spent the night there. We went to a, you know, an incredible mosque to see a mosque. We went to a killer museum to see some of the, the diggings. You know, uh, Pakistan is only, you know, 1947 is when the country was created. It used to be called Hindustan. And Pakistan, you know, the letters reflect the regions that were put together to create the area. And it was the first country created based off of religious ideology. But... You know, it goes back like 6,000 years. So the history in Pakistan in this region in terms of archaeology is, you know, goes past Egypt. So you're looking at all this crazy shit going back in time. And what what we learned while you were there was that, like, we've done such a wicked paint job on the Middle East that it makes it look like the Middle East is just this out of control freak show of a place. And what you learn when you get into these regions is that because they're all mountain regions, they're regions that are really built from the glaciers. So Pakistan's got 7,000 glaciers. It's called like the top of the world. You have more uh, elevation there than any place else. You have the three biggest mountain ranges in the world converge, the Himalayas, the Kurukuram, and the Hindu Kush. And you have the, you got the Indus River, which is twice the flow of the Nile and one third the earth relies on it for their water. And so what you have is this area that's, that's extremely arid and dry, but with the most incredible quality of water flow I've ever seen in my life. And so you start to understand like the stories of Shangri-La, 
where you have regions that were supposed to be these oases in the mountains. And I could never understand how that occurred until I got there. And, you know, we're in the Hunza Valley and I'm in a t-shirt and I'm talking, it's at, it's at like 9,000 feet. And I could have wore shorts and flip-flops and felt comfortable. Bone dry, but with incredible water moving through it through the glaciers. So basically all these regions are shaped from this glacial activity. And the, the mountains are massive beyond belief. We went up to 14,000 feet, but the peaks are at 28. And that, that brutal environment creates a different type of culture that has this ideology of all travelers are treated equivalent to family. And I, in my life, have never been anywhere where so many strangers came up to you just to be friendly and offer friendship. It was just so abnormal. Because the minute we get back to the U.S., as soon as we're in line in customs, we're not moving quick enough. Some lady screams at me from behind my back. You need to move quicker. And I'm laughing because you're not going to go anywhere, right? You're in, you're in the fucking customs line. And we realize, oh, we're back in America. And it's not that America is bad. It's just that our cultural habits of treating strangers is radically different. And so we get into Islamabad and all of a sudden we just see this incredible friendliness and it was just really, really like shocking at the level of genuine joy to see travelers and foreigners in the country. And so the country had a really thriving tourism industry until 9-11. And then after 9-11, it just basically wiped it out. So it took us probably like four or five days before we saw a single white person. And it was a German up in the mountains, right? And it's funny because you always see a German. German travelers, man, they're the hikers of the world. But so there was nobody that looked anywhere like you. And you couldn't have had a, a more friendly type reception from anywhere you went. Kids were coming up and wanting to take photos with you. And I mean, all strangers, elderly people would come up and ask you. And, and they were just so grateful that we were there to visit the country. And so it was just this beautiful welcome. So, you know, it's never bad to get six quarter pounds of killer indoor and then a, a, a half a key of hash to start the party. But the reception from the team and the reception from the locals was just mind bending. I uh, just really, really, that's what I, I left with is like, holy shit, man, the Middle East as a culture has a radically different relationship with strangers. So we go from Islamabad and we, uh, we have, you know, a beautiful dinner up on the roof of some building overlooking Islamabad and we start to get into the cuisine and every place we went had different spices and flavors in the teas, in the curries, in the rices, in the lentils. And so you started to really get this feel. And I think it took, I think it took Let's Be Friends Pakistan maybe seven, eight months to put this trip together because it was this, it was from the moment you touched the ground till the moment we left was nonstop movement. So I think we traveled over a thousand miles on the Kurukuram Highway, which is, if you look it up, it's considered the most deadly highway in the world. But it was, it was like Humboldt times 20. So you're driving through these mountains and you're driving through these hills, except these are the Himalayas, the Kurukuram and the Hindu Kush. And a little factoid that's cool is the Hindu Kush really means Hindu killers. Because the, when they traveled the Silk Route, the bandits would come down from that Hindu range and kill everybody and steal the goods. And so they called the Hindu Kush the Hindu killers. And it kind of made me wonder, is that why we call herb kill? You know, like is Kush is the kill because really it translates to that. And so the three largest mountain ranges in the world converge in a region. And you're just traveling through it, recreating the Silk Route and heading into regions to explore the weed. And so we, we take off out of Islamabad and then we head up to Naran and we, we go um, you know, over these mountain passes that are just savage. I'm talking cold wind that cut through your clothes like a friggin' lightsaber. And I'm freezing to death and I'm shaking and I'm like, holy shit, this is miserable. And I turn around and there's this little kid chilling, cooking some corn on a fire, right? We're in a blanket. And it just let me know just how soft you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, you think you're like an explorer. And you got little kids handling this shit, man. We're about to die. But it was, it was, it's almost impossible to explain the complexity because you're talking about the three largest mountain ranges in the world. 
and to travel along them is every time you turned around and you looked, you'd see another 20,000 foot peak. You turn your head and you'd realize, you know, you were a thousand foot to the river. You'd hang your head out the window and realize you were a couple thousand foot of cliff above you. So it was this minimization of you. You just started to really understand some of the cultural aspects. There was a phrase that they use in Muslim culture that I I thought was really like religious based as just this is what we do. I didn't understand that the region drove that home so hard. And it was this phrase called inshallah. And it means Allah's will. And it's it's and it's just God's will. It, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a uh, Muslim. It's just really about how man has uh, a plan and how the plan of God is bigger. And when you're in the mountains, you understand it because we're cruising through the Korakorum and all of a sudden the road in front of us just whites out. And off, us in the car are like, whoa, there must be some construction. Why would they do it right now during the day like this? And we realized when the smoke cleared, it wasn't construction. It was a rock the size of a refrigerator that had fallen down from the top of a mountain <clears throat> and had absolutely smashed this wheelbarrow into powder because the handles are poking out and the wheels all crushed. And I realized, holy shit, this is all, this is all landslide. So we cross over the range and we're cruising down the other side and all of a sudden it's getting dark and the slide had wiped out the whole road. And you're talking like, you know, good 500, 600 foot right off the edge into the river. And uh, we, we stopped. And one of the cats we were with uh, on us, he gets out of the, the Jeep and he's a big full size guy, but he's got a voice like Moses. And he says, together, we shall move the rocks. And I swear <laughs> to God, a hundred cars opened up their doors and everyone ran to fucking clear the rocks. Right. And I mean, it's on the edge of a canyon and it's shit's falling down. And by hand, they're clearing the rocks and they get the cars to come over. And it's some of the trickiest shit you ever saw in your life. And, and the guys were with us saying, hey, let us drive the rigs alone. So if we die, we die alone. I mean, that's the words coming out of their mouth. Just this acceptance of it'll be all right. But if we die, we don't die with the group. And so they get the cars over. And me and Ralph, the photographer, are walking and he's filming. And all of a sudden we hear this little tinkling sound like ding, 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 ding. ding. And we're like, oh, look, there's a little bit of rock coming down. And then all of a sudden rocks start flying by our head the size of cantaloupe. And we realized, holy shit, the whole hill's coming down. And you got to see the film, man. Ralph is filming this. And I got to joint my mouth. And Ralph is filming this. And we're walking on the edge of this cliff to get to Itacaza. And all of a sudden, we realize that this whole mountain's about to come down. And we start running for our lives, right? And you got to see the camera because, like, Ralph's a pro cameraman and everything's choice. And all of a sudden, it's like, holy shit, run for your life. And the camera's jumping all over the fucking place. And we're running for our lives because this shit's flying by like missiles. And then we all hop in the rig and we're all safe. And boom, we go to dinner. And so, you know, living in the mountains was just absolutely insane. And it, it, it's, it's, it was like Humboldt's a baby version. And I can see why Humboldt, it's funny, but all the years I've been here and, and growing here, it made me feel like I was in those mountains because of the impact and the isolation and how you're like, you're not in control. But man, when you get into the, the Himalayas, the Kurukuram and the, and the Hindu Kush convergence, oh, baby, you're not in control of anything. You are absolutely a speck. And you could drive for nine hours and all you see is mo stunning mountains, but every form of uh, geography humanly possible. But before we take off from Islamabad, they want to show me a population of feral cannabis, right? So I'm like, great. I've never seen wild cannabis. It's truly there. They figure cannabis has been in that area for 6,000 years. And so every one of the villages we went to, they all had basically an oral history that was between like 1500 to 1700 years of when we got to this region, when we got to this valley, herb was already here. So all these people had this, this time, but we know through ethnobotanical research that, you know, cannabis comes from the, the Himalaya plains, Mongolia moves down, sweeps in, gets into Pakistan, Afghanistan around 6,000 years ago. So they, I wanted to see some feral crops. So we walk into a field and they show me a plant and I'm like, oh my gosh, look, this thing's pollinated. There must be a male. And they go, look to your left. And I look to my left and it's a friggin' acre of wild herb. And I'm cracking up because it was what herb used to look like. 
And it was a product that they discovered that the, the goats ate, just like coffee. And so coffee was discovered by goats. The farmers see the, 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 the goat eat the coffee bean. They see it get excited. They figure out they have to roast it in order to get the real benefit. But coffee is an Arabic discovery through the goat. And so to me, more than likely, the goat discovered cannabis because it ate the seeds. And so they go and collect the seed. They use it as a food source. They take the product and start to make it into teas. They learn how to separate and sieve. It goes into hash. But to see this wild product in a region was mind-bended because I did all this work on the Appalachians in California. So there was, you know, Calvino and Janine Coleman and Frenchie were really, really driving it forward. And it got me really turned on to it. And I had a guy that I worked with, Luke Bruner, really research it, which gave me like a really good understanding of how Appalachians were created and the criteria. And so when I had the chance to have a senator in my office, I said, hey, this is how we should approach cannabis in California as we go forward. And that's what really initiated the Appalachian program. But the thing is that in California, grape and cannabis, you can't have an Appalachian technically because in order for it to be a true Appalachian, the region had to have built the plant. And so what we do is we create these AVAs, these amended viticultural agreements. And what that does, it allows us to say that our culture is genuine with the product. Our region has an impact, but we do not have a genetic history. And so even when you're in the Americas and you're in like, when I'm working in Colombia, the Colombians are like, hey, you know, we just know that it came from the rainforest, but they can only go back five, 600 years. They don't have a history any further than that. And so in all actuality, it's almost like only that Mongolia, China, Asia can really say in Africa, parts of Africa too, because they have, you know, multi-thousand year development that cannabis absolutely developed in relationship with the environment. And so to kind of touch it was poignant because for me, you know, I, I get into herb when I'm 12 and I was just riveted to the whole big picture herb. And once I realized that this stuff that was cush that we were, you know, catching occasionally was coming out of these regions, I had this dream of visiting the Middle East. I always wanted to see the, you know, Asia and, and where it came from. And I just didn't think I was ever going to be able to go because of all the political unrest. And I was also taught as an American that, oh, they're completely unfriendly. I mean, I wish I had, if I could take the phone and capture the test, I'd send it to you. But right before I get on the plane, someone sends me a text, right? And it says, they're going to cut off your head. Then they're going to ransom your body and you're not worth enough money to get a ransom. And so your family's going to have to leave you over there. I mean, this is like some brutal shit, right? And I was catching this from a bunch of people. You're an idiot. You're over there trying to gather genes. And I'm like, no, I'm not trying to gather genes. I'm being asked to help a team look at genes. And I'm being brought over as, I, I and, and it's not as like a big word, but like an emissary, an ambassador, someone that can say, hey, this is the trip we took. This is the time we had. This is what the people will like. And so it wasn't about the genes because there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies that gather genes and I, and I mess with most of them. So my access on the gene game is about as strong as anybody I know. And it wasn't about the genes. It was fascinating to hunt the genes and see the genes, but it was really about the place that built the plant that built my whole life. And because Doug had gathered the stock from Terra, it creates this incredible relationship because Doug and I are friends. And so we're the, the university's trying to document and capture this history before it's removed. And Doug is like, hey, here's the treasure map. And so we treated it like a treasure hunt where we went on this journey to document a place, document the people, and then to go work with Team Land Race as they did their 2023 collection so that we would find the valley where the seeds were gathered that built the modern industry so that we could recreate the Silk Route anew, but this time with reciprocity. And so the issue is that when you when you take product from a country and you use it to build an industry and that country doesn't get any benefit from it, it's catastrophic. And so they've created things called like the Nagoya protocols, which are these protocols put in place between com countries that have treaties, which is tough because we don't have them with most of these countries that have the initial supply. But it sets a precedent that says 
if you're going to take something from a country and use it to make money, there has to be an ongoing benefit to the country you took it from. And so the idea is to say, hey, how do we create the relationship that allows farms in Pakistan, farms in Afghanistan, farms in India to be able to benefit from this industry that's being exploded globally and create some form of parity and fairness. And so the, you know, the intent of the trip was just really pure and I just didn't expect it to be, you know, so over the top in terms of what we saw and what we did. And normally when you travel, you put 20 people in, in five rigs, man, it's a nightmare if you're in them all day. And in this case, it was like the coolest 19 people I'd hung out with, you know, in a long time, it was like hanging out with my, like my, my family and my crew from Humboldt because everybody was there for the same purpose to experience, explore, be good ambassadors and, and really kind of feel the vibe of a world that none of us had ever experienced. And so it was just this phenomenal, you know, that the, it was like emotional. You, you kind of got overwhelmed in the reality of it for people like me, like I spent my whole life in weed. And so for me to go back to the motherland of grass and to hang out and experience it and see the feral crops. And then we start to head up the mountains and everywhere we went, you could see herb growing until we got up to the higher altitude. So no matter where you went, you would see herb growing wild. And we end up, you know, climbing up into Nagar. We go to Nagar, we go to this beautiful inn and we start to get turned on to, you know, cultural practices, you know, shared dinners interesting music. Each, each region has its own cultural dance. And it was just warm and welcoming. And you saw all the little kids playing and you got to see a lot of goats. And, and I was obsessed to have the goats, man. I was obsessed with the markour. I was trying to see a markour the whole time I was there, which is like the symbol of Pakistan, but it's like the j biggest goat in the world. That's the Ibex. I wanted to see one of those too, but the markour with the twisty horns, I couldn't find the damn thing. And I was obsessed. I was like, where's the Makur? And it was, it was just so rugged and raw. And we end up, you know, getting into the, the Hunza region. There it is. There's the Makur. And so in my mind, I'm like, I'm an old bearded goat. And so that was, that was becoming my like mountain spirit animal. But we, we, we end up getting into, you know, it, 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 we, we did so many things that it's impossible to cover them all. But it was just. Hey, Kev. Yeah. You even fucking danced, man. I've known you for 20 plus years. I've never seen you boogie, bro. You know, we never been to the club together. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, they, they, it was, you kind of had to participate because what they wanted was they wanted to share their culture with you. And it was so genuine and it mattered to them because it's their survival as well. And so, you know, they had this thriving tourist industry until 9-11 and then it just got decimated. And when you, you know, I mean, in my mind, I was going to be traveling in the desert, dragging my bags, sleeping in rock huts, you know, eating out of a bowl. And I had no idea that it was going to be like that. And so they're, they're playing music right now. And it's, it's the flute is an apricot wood flute. So the, the, the flute is made out of apricot wood. And, and each place we went had their own dances, their own music, and their own instruments. And so it was just this cultural smorgasbord. And, and the guy that's standing there dancing now, he owned that Hunza Inn. And he couldn't have been a better host. Just a, an absolute sweetheart. And when you, when you were at his inn and you looked out the windows, you got to see mountain ranges in every direction that just blew your mind where... I've, I mean, I've been in a lot of hotels. I've never been in a hotel in my life that was equivalent to the view coming out of the Hunza Hills. I mean, it was insane. And just killer food. What I love, too, is every hotel we went to, the inns, they didn't have a menu. They served you the meal they were serving. So you sat down and the meal came out. You didn't have a choice. You got to choose, like, fizzy drink, tea, or water. But you didn't choose the food. It came in... in platters on the table and it was just incredible to experience it in such a simple manner because you're all getting eat you know kind of collaboratively so the hunza was phenomenal but the hunza is a region 
that has the oldest people in the world. So the Hunza is like 9,000, 10,000 foot valley, but the, the average age of these elderly are over 100. So it's world renowned for the longevity of the population because when you were in the Hunza, you got to understand the whole basis of organic agriculture in terms of nutrient density, where you've never had walnuts that rich. When you broke an apple in half, you had to use a machete to cut it because it was so hard and so sweet. The dried fruit, the plums, the, the peaches, the cherries, just insane. And you're at, you know, like 10,000 foot. And we, we, I get up in the morning early so I can go look at the mountains. And, and uh, Arslan, the photographer, and um, uh, uh, Anas, uh, a friend, they're climbing. So I said, hey, let me go climb the mountain with you. And so we go climb this mountain. And as we're climbing it, we see all these like seven and eight year old kids hiking down the mountain to go to school in the morning. So they're all coming down the school and we're laughing because this frigging mountain is like vertical. And these kids are running down it like goats laughing. And we're talking to them like, you know, how often do you go up and down the hill? And one little girl goes, oh, multiple times a day. And so she waves and she just runs down the hill. And then this father comes over the top of it with like a three year old on his back. And he's carrying him and he laughs and he goes, he's not old enough to walk on his own yet. And he's carrying him down the hill. Mind you now, like we're struggling to climb this shit. It's it, you know, you're at 10,000 feet. It's vertical. We're climbing. And these kids are dancing down the rocks in school clothes, laughing with their backpacks. And we get to the top of that ridge and it was a beautiful irrigated field all filled with um, apple. And the, the, the people that were running that farm, the owners said, hey, they... They were like, please take as much as you want. And it was just everywhere we went, no matter what village you popped into or what farm you you bumped into, as soon as the people saw each other, they would come forward and, and ask you, please share some of our stuff. And it was just, I just can't say enough about that part of it where it was just so not normal for me to be able to walk into someone's yard and have them say, hey. Would you like to look at the weed? Would you Would you like to have some food? If you have a moment, I'll cook up some water and we'll have some tea. And it was just so genuine and chill that it just made you feel like you were home. And herb is different in, in, in these regions in terms of at first it was like, you know, it was a food source. So still primarily like a food source. They use cannabis seed as their winter food source and they fry it up with wheat. So what they have is uh, healthy omegas, fats, and, and, and it keeps them warm in the winter time. And then they also use the, the, the resin to make teas for wellness and health for all the people. And then after so many thousand years, they figure out really how to sieve it and they create hash. But cannabis is woven into their world in a way that's just so complete. And it was just really beautiful to see it. And the thing is that, you know, when you're talking about herb in the regions, it's basically purple and green populations, which is what it is all, all over the place, basically two colors. And so those are your um, flavonoid pigmentation, and it's, it's about survivability. And when it came to seed, they didn't breed for big seed. What they bred for was diverse seed. So what it did is it allowed them to have a survivability and that way, no matter what, there was always going to be a crop. So when we went, we went through, you know, every one of the farms had like a full agricultural patch of food. And then they would have like a quarter acre, half acre of, of flour. So every farm we went to had a quarter, half acre of flour, plus all their ag. And what I did was I gathered soil samples from each of the eight collection sites we went to. So we went to eight different regions, eight different locations, gathering stock. And I collected soil so that we're able to do soil analysis so we can kind of figure out, you know, what do we see? And what we saw was these really interesting patterns where potato farms, fruit farms, like uh, uh, nut farms, all had profiles that were kind of unique to each one of them. So there was like this symbiosis between the plants that grew naturally and cannabis that was growing naturally. And... For me, it was just a, it was a joy because like, I mean, I hunt stock full time and I didn't know what to expect when we got there. But when I met the land race team, which is really three brothers, Kashi, Numi, 
and uh, Hami. And so I had such a good time with them that they adopted me and made me fifth brother. And so now I'm the fifth brother of the family. But the brothers, were they've been doing this for seven years hunting, and they were absolute assassins on choosing quality. And so we had Jamie with us, too, and we had uh, Imran, who's sharp. So we had, you know, six sharp guys hunting, and all we did was go through these populations looking for outliers. And as soon as we found one, we would all converge on it. We'd take a look. We'd identify why we liked it, and I'd journal it. So I think we ended up collecting over the course of that period, maybe 50 different samples. And we had a full pickup truck full of herb and trash bags. So every plant we cut, we broke down in trash bags and we're moving it. And every night when we got to the inn, we would break it down and start. Yes, that was that was the final breakdown. But imagine every one of those bags reflects a, a 10 foot plant. And so each single night we would work through the night, breaking down the herb, sifting it out and leave the, 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 the bags labeled out because it's so dry that it would dry it so that we weren't having any enzymatic activity. I mean, which is the issue with seed is that when you keep it moist and you start to fluctuate temperature, it starts to activate the enzymes and it starts to deteriorate your viability for long-term germination. So the idea is to pick it and dry it, but it's tough when you're moving through the regions on the selection. And then each place we went, we started to note the patterns and because the brothers had been so efficient at doing what they've done for the last seven years, they knew the patterns. And so it allowed me to be able to say, okay, this is what we're seeing. Let's log it. Let's find the outliers. And then each place we went, if we found something that surpassed it, we would then cull what we had and add the new one. Or we would just say the one we got in patch two was superior to the ones we found here. And what we ended up finding was just this smorgasbord of profiles that were just mind bendingly unique where I didn't have the olfactory memory to describe it because I don't know those odors. I just knew that it, it cut through the air like a laser beam and you swooned when you smelled it. And all the plants were chosen primarily off of, you know, morphology, meaning like the bodies had to be good, it had to have a healthy plant. And then what factors we were choosing. And so some of it was like resin so grainy, it felt like salt on your fingers. So you knew it was going to be good wash. Plants that were so wet with essential oils that when you rubbed against them, you'd look up in the air and thought it was raining on you because your arm was wet. I mean, like soaked in grease. It was trippy. Um, just odors and compounds and, and bud structure and just... It was this smorgasbord. I got a, a, a entire journal that I logged every one of these collections in and wrote down descriptions of the entire thing so that we'd be, really be able to say, okay, what, what are we doing and what did we gather? So what you end up experiencing is, is working with people who live in a region that are absolutely talented at their craft, and they're trying to show you the cannabis population of an area coupled up with your, your hanging out with uh, Let's Be Friends Pakistan, which is a tourism-based organization. And they're trying to get you to be able to get the vibe of Pakistan and feel it in the way that when you left, you brought it home to tell others. Because I'm telling you, I'd go back to Pakistan like that. Like I, I actually, for a minute said, I think I could live in the Hunza because it was small little farms and everyone was happy. There was peace. The, the kids were playing. It was just beautiful. The weather was gorgeous. The grass was killer. And I was like, I could live here. I could farm. I could sieve hash. And I could try to live to 100 because the environment absolutely makes you healthier. You, you, just like with the word, you know, herb, when, you, when, you, when you're growing herb and you, you cut it in half, most modern herb is kind of, um, it falls apart. We haven't built it for resiliency and the way we steer it is always towards a uh, specific. Some of this shit, you had to step on the plant to try to rip the branches off and you almost cut your hands because the epidural layer was so aggressive. Like I've never ripped plants apart that were that tough. When you cut them, there was no pit. It was like, it was completely lignified. You could have made a stick out of this to whip someone's ass. It was, it was just like, just really weird. And when you work with herb full time 
And I worked it within a bunch of different countries. That Hunza fertility and quality and air cleanliness and water cleanliness was just absolutely unique. And the Hunza is connected to the Hooper Glacier, which is this massive glacier. And so like, I thought that it's funny, you're, you're, you're we, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're living the way we live, sometimes you just don't really have an idea what things mean. And so to me, glaciers with sea ice that broke free, I didn't quite catch the fact that it's the drainage from the basins from the Himalayas and Kurukurum and the Kush mountains. And we got to see this glacier that was miles long, you know, half a mile wide, hundred yards thick. And the top of it looked like the ocean frozen, but each wave was like a hundred feet. And they're just driving through the canyons and it's creating these lateral moraines, which push left and right and a forward moraine, which plows. And it's, and the mountains are constantly rising. So the, that whole region is really pretty new in ge geography terms. So like maybe 30 million years. So extremely sharp and aggressive and moving. The Andes are rounded, older mountains. And so it, all the mineral was being just forced and pushed into these canyons. And so you're at this, this Hunja, uh, this, this, the Hopa Glacier, which was tremendous. And when just, we're just, done. Just, just, just quickly, Kevin, what was, once you hit Islamabad, did you then go north? Was that yes, the first? Yes, we went on. Okay. We, yeah, we went north up through that journey. And we started really following these, these silk routes. And there was, you know, we went to all these forts. It, I have the whole itinerary. So um, Newman the, the, is going to send me the whole, like this was the whole plan plotted out. And I have maps so I can lay it out. But it, we were moving so fast and so hard and did so much every day that it was almost like impossible. It would take me 21 days to tell you what we did because it was 21 days to do it. But that the glacier up in the, in the, in the Hooper was incredible. And we go and have a meeting with the villagers and Danny interviews the elder that, um, you know, was the oldest person in the village. And he was the one who had brought potato to the region. He said, I brought the potato to the region here. And he's like, I grew up in that, that hut there. My family got here 1500 years ago. Herb was here then. And he invites us to dinner. And so we go to dinner and on the table is this big, it looked like a carved metal pot, right? It was big, ornate, right? Big kind of like a pumpkin. You know, you cut the top of the pumpkin off. It had that shape. And it was all ornately carved and it was thin. It was a stone pot that was a thousand years old. And they only broke it out for like special guests and visitors. And what they do is they take the pot and they put it in a kiln and they heat it up till it's red hot, like, you know, glowing. And they throw all the food in it. And that's how they cooked it. And when they told me it was a thousand year old pot, I didn't want to touch it because I just knew that my American ass was going to break it. And I'm just like, no, <laughs> I didn't want to touch the pot. And though so they had a wooden spoon, which made me feel safe because then I, I knew that the wooden spoon wouldn't break the pot. But, you know, you're talking, you're eating out of a thousand year bowl. And so, you know, it's just... I, I, I look at it like, you know, like, our, like for me as, as an American, my family lived in the same house in New England for 300 years. So to me, I'm old New England. I'm old first, you know, late end of the 1600s we got here and settled in Maine, settled in that region and stayed in the same same homes on the ocean as seafaring people for 300 years. Right. So for the U.S., like we're old family. But, you know, when you go to another country and you're eating out of a thousand year stone pot, it, it kind of really helps you realize just how little our blip is. And it's not against anything that we do here. It's just this relevance of like, you've kept a pot in the house for a thousand years. Like, what's the care required to do that? And so you you start to experience these, these um, cultural differences that are just they, they kind of help you learn to appreciate little details better. And we end up, we end up going over to a fort that was a, like a thousand year old fort. And they had actually, the silk route went through the fort. And there's a picture of me standing with my hands on some walls that I sent you. That's the actual silk route. Those are the bricks they walked on 1500 years ago. And the fort had this water pool in it. And they were saying that, you know, in order to be a soldier, you had to swim the distance of the pool underwater. So I stuck my hand in it and I was like, I could do that shit right now. 
And then the, the, the tour guide goes, no, we did it in the winter and we froze it solid and we drilled two holes and you went in one hole. And if you came out the other at the other end, you were qualified to be in the military. And all I could think of was how many bodies are frozen under the bottom of that thing. Because holy shit, man, that was like, it was extreme. So you're, you're, you're just kind of getting to experience because it's all existing. And all these pieces are still there. You're getting to see the, the history that built Europe, which is my ancestry. I'm all, you know, Northern Eastern European. And my, my world was built from the goods and the products that moved through the Silk Route. It's what evolved Europe. Europe was able to lift up because of the technological advances from Asia. And we then take off and become a powerhouse in our own regard. But it was just such a, a neat experience to be able to walk the road that the goods passed on. And every place we went, let's be friends, Pakistan brought uh, people with us that just allowed us to get an education. And I was just blessed that everyone we rolled with had this incredible relationship with Pakistan that tripped me out. So I asked them, I said, you guys school teachers? Because their knowledge of their area and their history was just different. And what it was, was they said, no, all of us, um, most of us have lived in other countries and we were treated so poorly because we were minorities that we had a choice to either throw our culture away and just, you know, acclimate into the new world or really embrace our culture. And they chose to embrace it. And it was beautiful because it allowed you to get a, 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 an incredible historical perspective of all the things that created the region, what occurred. And then by me being in the rig I was in, I had Imran with me, who's um, a brilliant, brilliant young guy, a, a high level extractor from Canada, but he has a, a love and appreciation for his native country. And so he was able to help me see things through like a Western lens so that I could better understand what we saw. And you, you just went back in time and saw a region that was the middle point for the goods moving through the earth. And at no time during this trip, did you not feel like you were on the Silk Road yourself? You know, it was crazy. It was crazy. And I've asked pretty much like most of the group to be on the chat. So anybody who's got questions that I'm not answering or I'm, you know, going off on a tangent, the, most of the group is on the chat. So if anybody wants to throw any questions out and, and chat with the group, I invited them all because I couldn't have been more impressed with not just how smart and sharp and cool, but how kind it was a unique, it was a unique junket. It's it, And I mean, I've done a lot of shit, man. I, I've done all kinds of work in the military, done work with tons of different people on projects. This one stood on its own because of the way there was a cohesive nature and the desire was so common to do something good. And the farms that they went to, they, they with their same goal at, that I would say, uh, Iran Z from land race exchange. I, I think that he's an excellent individual, same desires. You got land race warden, you got Khalifa genetics, all these individuals that collect genes from those regions, their motivation is, is to bring attention to the area and hopefully bring some income to the farms so that what you have is a better situation. Average income in Pakistan is like 1500 bucks US a year. If you're making good money in Pakistan, you're making like six grand. And so uh, a small change in income is a radical change. And they use that money to fund their kids to go to school. And so the, 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 the idea of all these different groups, and that's why I've been got involved with a bunch of them in terms of like support or, or conversation or trying to like push the genetics forward was because I understood their desire. And for the land race team, it was the same desire that there was a purity of, we want to see a better Pakistan. We want to see the farmers get the credit. We want to see these incredible genes make it into the world so that we can influence gene pools around the world. And most of these places are really still pure because the European genes didn't get into them. So they're, they're too isolated and they, they're not really interested in what you, what you have. They, what they want is survivability. And so like when I talked to the farmers, I said, do you maintain your own genetics? And they said, no, all of us in the regions, all of us in the villages, we all share genes. We all try to work together to create a better homogenous product and safety valve so that they got food. 
And so it, it's, it's just so different. If you're in, like, fuck, I've been in weed for a long time. If you got the cut, you hoard the cut, all this little who's got the, who's got the cut, who's got the genes, who's in charge. And because of it, most of the really good shit got lost because anytime anybody got popped, plant's gone. Anytime you got hop latent, plant gone. Anytime anything happened, plant gone. And so we've absolutely destroyed our legacy by being silos because we want to be, you know, like we're in control. This is my identity. And instead of trying to really say, look, it's my culture and culture means more than one. And so you, you, you kind of get to see how they've operated and worked for, you know, 1500 years. So it was a really good education in, in, in behavior. And it's one that I think a lot of us have been trying to work on for a while where we're trying to share information, share genetics and, and, and get the world caught up into what we do in a way that allows us to transcend just cannabis. Because once you start to behave in a certain way, it catches the attention of other individuals. And even if they don't smoke weed, they go, that's a good culture. The behavior is right. The treatment of each other is right. The equity is correct. The reciprocity is correct. And then what you have is respect which is what we really had to fight for in cannabis because we were demonized due to the drug war. So the drug war makes every one of us look like we're a bunch of, bunch of fucking lunatics and idiots on purpose. And for me, I've been trying to fight through that stigma where I'm definitely a lunatic, but I don't think I'm an idiot. And I don't think that the people I work with are, I don't think the community is. And I think that, you know, by being able to start to move this forward in this way, you really start to change the, the dialogue. It was cool. Tell them about some of your interviews, Dan. Oh, shit. Yo, it's been amazing. You know, it's always dope listening to Kev. Thank you, uh, Peter, for having me on. What's up, Jamal? Hey. Uh, what's up to everybody that's watching? Uh, yo, of course, we had the time of our lives. And thank you, Let's Be Friends Pakistan. And thank you, Team Land Race Genetics, first and foremost. And I definitely echo everything Kevin's saying. And when you get uh, treated like a brother and in a way that you're unaccustomed to, it's enough to move one's soul even, you know? So at the end of the day, no matter uh, who you are, we, we all share that in common, you know, so that to have that fucking moved for you and, and to force new perspectives was, is like a, a, an eternal gift. So um, thank you guys. And that being said, um, yo, the interviews were beautiful. And one of the epiphanies that I had is that as a global cannabis community, it's important to also showcase, not just as an example, uh, the means of communication being the English language, but to also feature, you know, Urdu, which is the national language of Pakistan, and Pashto, which is what our Pashtun Afridi brothers speak. And primarily you see, um, you know, these brothers in an area where uh, borders Afghanistan. So you can say it's like an Afghani culture um, is, is fair to say. Um, and it really, it really was in my heart to connect with Af our Afghani brothers, uh, primarily just because of the history behind Afghanistan, you know, and whether we're talking about Native Americans or, or Pashtuns, I really admire that, that bravery to, to fight, you know, for, to not be conquered, to not get rolled over. Uh, so that, that to me was really, to answer your question, Kev, you know, one of my highlights was interviewing Asif. And um, Afridi, you know, Sabir Bai, I believe is his name, uh, in um, uh, Shodan, I think it's Sh mm -hmm. Shodan, uh, in the chalet, and like it was like the Swiss Alps real quick. Um, and I really enjoyed, you know, them being comfortable with me enough to really open up. We talked about everything. We talked about from A to Z. And uh, we, we hosted a handful of interviews, including Kev, of course, and members of the team, uh, Numi and Hammy. Uh, and, and Numan, and ultimately, I feel really uh, happy with the scope of work that we were able to accomplish, and that would not have happened without John and Rolf. So, you know, big shout out to these guys who also took a leap of faith. And you guys want to hear the true story? Is that I told Team Land Race Next, I said, me and Kev were operators, so we're taking this leap of faith with a different mentality. You know, in terms of like uh, risks that may may have we may may be taken you know, uh, some dangers that may be involved. We understand why we're going. Whereas Rolf and John, I said, they're more like civilians. You know, they primarily do camera work and, and video work and they love weed, but they've, they're not in the game, you know, like, like me and Kev. And so 
Um, I really commend Rolf and John for taking that leap of faith because I kept saying, especially after October 7th, uh, it was like, dude, everybody's really, really worried. And uh, the truth is, is again, I got to give a big, big, um, big ups to the you know Islamic culture and, and our Muslim brothers and sisters, because at no time did I see any kind of road rage or violent altercations where you're in an environment where everybody's honking the horn and you think New York City traffic is bad. This is like Mad Max shit, you know, it's wild, um, <laughs> but it's civilized and it's you see, you see it in the people and how, like Kev saying, everyone treats each other. And truthfully, as Americans, we're like celebrities, dude. People haven't seen Americans in ages, and it's a rare thing. And so it was really heartwarming to see that where you go into a, a country, a foreign country, and everything you're taught is the opposite, or you know, all this Islamophobia is the word. Yeah, for it. and and this was something I definitely wanted to tease out of this conversation is just how warm and kind and host you know the hospitality of the people because i feel like you know the perception of different you know there's a difference between governments and people right mm -hmm. like we're all people we may not like our own government or we may love it and every country is the same and but it's it's about the people and and often the the narrative around the people is based on kind of our relationships with the government. And it was awesome to hear because, because those are the experiences I've had too, of just the kindest people you'll ever meet. Well, it's the religion too, Pete. Like what we, what you have is you have a paint job on any, anytime anything happens. And so we're talking to the, the guys and they're talking saying, Hey, there is no radical Muslim. Like it, it, there is no radical. It's not, there's, you're just Muslim. They said, but anytime anybody does anything in our religion wrong, the entire one and a half billion of us are faulty. He said, but you know, he said Hitler was Hitler was Christian. I don't see any, everybody jamming the Christian religion for Hitler's actions. And it was just such a true thing because in countries are countries, politicians are politicians. But at the end of the day, the people suffered the wrath of that. And, and that was the part that was, you know, I think so desirous of land race and of let's be friends Pakistan where they were able to say hey take a look at us as people like just turn the media off for a minute and come take a look at the region come experience the culture come experience the food come see the music take a look at the cannabis culture take a look at how people have lived in the mountains we had yak and I said this is cool and, and they laugh and they go mountain cow and so the yak is the mountain cow. And so when you're eating yak burgers up in the middle of the Himalayas, you're like, it doesn't get any cooler. But someone asked the question, I just was looking through the chat. It was about how do they address cultivation issues? Because for us, you know, we're VPD obsessed, we're EC, we're pH. Well, what they have is they are primarily outdoor. And, and like the indoor we had was killer. And it was stuff like, you know, Tropicana cookies and lemon, like lemon sorbet, you know, modern varieties. But a, a friend of the crew has a small indoor in Pakistan and just punched out some heat. So it was funny because indoor is indoor. You can do good indoor anywhere in the world. And it was awesome to have it. But what you have is regenerative Sorry, agriculture. Sorry, just quickly, the, the people growing indoor were kind of growing modern, kind of American, Western, oh, completely. Dutch modern, stuff. Yes, okay. yes. Modern, modern California lines under LEDs running a theme. Selling for top dollar, only available to the elite. Yeah, yeah, Athena, Athena Ag, LEDs, fucking running on like Trollmaster drip. I mean, like the, the the irony was incredible. I was like, holy shit! So, technology moved everywhere, but for the outdoor farms, it's purely regenerative ag, and so every farm has goat and sheep, and so they're using the goat and the sheep as as your food source, and they're also taking every single thing that's waste and they're leaving it on the ground and letting it break down. And what was kind of cool was that these people are masters of storage, meaning that because you don't have refrigeration in the mountains, they know how to preserve things using natural methods. And so every potato field had like a well in the middle of the field that they filled with the potatoes. And you've never had potatoes that good, but they can, they said that they know how to hold butter for 40 years, that they can cask up butter, wrap it in cloth seal it and put it in the ground and they have butter stashed 
for, for a century if needed all over the place as food source because you need fat as a, as a caloric load to handle the temperatures. And so the way they approached it, so really it was just regenerative ag. And it was like when I was in Colombia on a project and they did the same thing. They had grown an entire crop of plants that they were breaking down for ferments. And someone said, oh, they're using KNF. And I said, no, it's CNF, Colombian natural farming. Every every indigenous group figured out how to grow. And we, it was just called ag at one time. We didn't start to put the names on it until we really got into chemical ag and we started trying to differentiate. But at the end of the day, it's holistic agriculture where the products that they chop and cut, the waste goes back on the ground. They use the animals to come through and deposit. And because of the hooves digging into the ground, breaks it up and tills it. It sits fallow over the winter from the cold, just like the hash. They harvest the weed, let it sit, completely snows on the herb. But it's that, it's snow like, you know how when you're a kid, there's like the good wet snow that when you throw a snowball, you can bop someone's head, grab their shoulders with it. That wasn't the kind of snow. It was powder like Colorado, ultra dry snow that you really couldn't make a good snowball. So even though you were getting water from the snow, it was ultra dry. So they take the herb, they harvest it, they leave it out. It sits in the snow, which really lets it start to, to age and off gas because the fuel profiles that we love in America are not the ones they love there. They want to off gas the fuels. And when the fuels leave, what you end up getting is like these really interesting floral and fruits that kind of emerge, which was really surprising. And the hash has a, a more mellow feel to it. So it's not as aggressive as like a modern rosin. And it's the same with the quality of the sieving. And so there, we were hanging out with um, Saeed and Asef, two brothers from Tira. And uh, Asef is an uh, inn owner. And he, he said to me, I'm a tea man, which means he has an inn and he makes tea. And his brother was a professional hash maker. And I'm talking to his brother and his brother's like, you know, hash was, I mean, uh, herb was here when we got here 1500 years ago. And my first memories are making hash with my father when I was three and he's 35. So he's been making hash since he's three years old, but they're using these metal blades and they're riding them over silk screens. And it used to be different materials, but as time goes on, they get better seething ability, but it's still the same concept of first pass is always best. Now with water process in agitation, it doesn't always mean that you might get the best dump on the fourth wash. It depends on how the abscission layer breaks free. But the way they're working it on the screen, the first passes were incredible. And this shit was literally exploding in the flame. And I mean, just it didn't stop moving when you took the heat off. So the impurities were almost non-existent in this dry sift method. And he sifts four acres of plants himself. So his, his operation is connected to four acres of cultivation. And so each farm is like a, a, a tract they do the sieving and then they sell it all at these commercial bazaars where the product gets moved into the world. But, you know, we're talking, I want to say a key hash is like 150 US. So when you're talking, you know, a thousand grams of killer dry sift for a buck and a half, you know, it's just insane prices. And so, you know, hopefully as time goes on, what's able to occur is, is better trade routes to Europe because really... The, the products that are grown in these countries really fit European consumption methodologies better than ours. And that's where you got Morocco, Lebanon, that's, you know, Morocco's largest hash mover to Europe of any nation in the world. But it's what they're seeking is these traditional for Moroccans. It's a Moroccan Baldea. And I really got, I got um, a really good education on it from a, a friend named Osama Badad from Trilogene Seeds where He's Moroccan. He's a PhD geneticist, but he really helped me understand Moroccan cannabis culture and Moroccan genetics. And his desire was to do the same thing, to empower the Moroccans so that they're not being used as tools. Because the essence of colonialism is to export the natural resources, export the profit. So what you do is you take everything of value and you take the money. And we basically done that around the world forever. And the issue is that it's destroyed every small culture in the process. And what we end up getting is homogenized big business. And so in cannabis right now in the United States, you're probably looking at like 40 plants sold through. I get every clone list there is, right? There's no company that sells clones that doesn't send me a list. And so I go through them constantly because I'm trying to look at patterns. 
And what I can say is there's probably 40 plants used by 95% of the people in the state of California. There probably used to be 400. And, and we lost all that diversity because we lost these small farms. Because at the end of the day, that small farm can't produce what was really their, their defining product. And it's, it's compressing this gene pool and it's compressing the, the selections for the consumer. So if it doesn't have color, if it doesn't have Instagram ability, and it isn't pushing over 30 on the THC, we don't want it. And that's really controlled by distribution. And what you have is this dissatisfaction in the customer base that's pretty easy to understand because the illicit market is just as robust as it ever was. And instead of the politicians saying, okay, we built a broken system, what they're doing is they're pumping more money into the dope war to go after the traditional operators saying, it's your traditional operation that's causing this failure. And it's not, it's regulatory failure. And it's a failure to understand that the customer wants to be treated fairly. They want diversity in products and they would love to have it at a reasonable price. And so when you start to see this compression and this change, it's affecting us as well. And for years, you know, the U.S. cannabis, I mean, Humble County was doing eight billion a year. Right. So right now, the U.S. in 2023, the number is around 20 billion. Right. Humble at its heyday was doing eight billion by itself. We were producing 80% of the herb in the United States for consumption. So when, you, when you're when you here and you live here and you're part of it, the triangle was about $14 billion. And I got all these figures through working with the state. And I had done the, the economic research for, uh, at the time, it was Humboldt State University. But I created the first economic index for cannabis in the U.S. where they, they couldn't figure out what was the impact of cannabis on the economy. And they came to me and said, hey, could you help us figure this out? And I said, I think I can. I think I can get the data. And I came up with half a billion dollars of quantifiable data. And I did it as a favor for the university, but I didn't expect to get my name connected to the study. And my name connected to that study opened up every door in Sacramento because they said, how are you the only person in the state that could come up with half a billion dollars of quantifiable data? So it it made them see me in a different light, but it also allowed me to have conversations with them that were very honest. And so the head of the tax bureau, Fiona Ma and George Runner, they run the taxes of the state of California. That's the two captains of the tax game. They said, hey, you came up with half a billion on your own. We know how much money is really coming out of here because we can measure the velocity of the cash by how we have to move it out in trucks. And we know that Humboldt's about 8 billion and the triangle's about 14 billion total. And so now we're probably down to a billion, right? Maybe billion and a half in the, in the whole region. So, I mean, it's an incredible reduction. You know, you're talking, you know, 10 times less money being made now than just five years ago. And so where does it, where's that slope continue? How far down do we go? We, we figure it should stabilize around 1.8. But the point is that it's changed the landscape of who operates. It changes what's grown. It changes what's available. And when you can't keep genetics easily due to laws where you can only have six plants. If you have a nursery, you have to have a specific license. It has to be on certain zoning. If you're trying to run an outdoor farm and you're trying to keep plants alive year round, you don't have the ability because where do you do this legally? And so what you do is you keep cutting the gene pool down and down and down and down and down until eventually all the stuff that we call foundation stock that built the world we're in is missing. So like right now, everybody's looking for the old OG cut. And I'm cracking up because like we were drowning in OG just seven years ago. And now nobody has the cuts. Where's the original OG? I'm like, holy shit, nobody keeps anything because you can't afford to or it's too risky. And that's, I think, the, the, the thing that needs to be made aware of these countries is that these countries had products that were from the region. The region shaped the culture, shaped the people, shaped the herb right? The glaciers are here before herb. So the glacier is is what shaped everything. The glaciers shaped Pakistan and created these products and the ability to hold them in some form of uh, protection that allows these people to benefit from it is the the, the game. And now, now that, you know, us in the U.S. are in the same game, we're basically being exterminated and you're getting stomped on every step of the way. And you have MSOs that are on these, um, we don't need to make any money because we're basically going to oligarchy model your ass out of existence where we're going to go on a five-year losing price war until you're gone. What do we got? And so 
being able to go over there and see what they did and how they did it and how their cultures have worked with cannabis, you know, Saeed says 1,500 years, the old gentleman we were with, 1,500, 1,800 years. We know from research that it's really like 6,000 when you look at it. We're trimming this shit out. What's the impact? So, you know, that's, that's the story is how do you get individuals to really work together to hold genes? And, and that's what I did with um, Iran Z, where he said, hey, we have this project in Afghanistan. I'd love for you to be part of it and just bring attention. And so I went and took stock from Ghazni, Afghanistan, and I opened up the population and I sifted it out and I ran it indoor to get all the intersex traits out. And then I took that stock and I provided it all over the world for free so that people would have access to this Ghazni Afghani lines. Lo and behold, it goes through a war, another war in the region. All the farms that we collected from are gone. So the stock we have now in people's hands all over the world is really the gene base that existed. And the part that tripped me out was I bet I got hit up by like, you know, 25 former military operators that said, hey, I lost friends in Ghazni. We fought to the death on that territory. Could I please get seeds from you so that we can uh, have a better existence? And, and remember that region in a way that's healthy instead of the trauma that we have. And so genes are more than just genes. They, genes, are, genes are connections to your, your soul. So it, it, it's weird because like, I don't think I'm that deep, but I get to be around people who are, and I get to see these impacts that are just beyond comprehension. And to be part of it is just unreal. You know, it, it was amazing. They brought a really talented photographer with us uh, 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 Ar- Arslan and man, that boy could shoot some photos. And so th- what we've captured is this massive journey on, on disc. And then I go and talk to Doug fur today, me and Doug and Dominic are going to get together for lunch and start to talk about how do we lay out this story so that we can really tell this story of how a young man in his twenties gathers stock in a country, brings it back to Humboldt, launches an industry that's worth 20 billion a year today and the Pakistanis really never benefited from it. And that's not Doug's fault. It's just the nature of how the world works and how do we work together to create a more equitable situation. And I know that I can't do it alone because I'm just me. But when you get many where we and the the ability to be able to touch the nations and bring them together in a way that is genuine it's, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful mission. It's, it's one that, you know, it's hard not for people to want to be involved in to some degree because the benefit is being spread about. It's not about, I'm going to monopolize the gene pool of Pakistan. It's that I'm not trying to monopolize anything. It's that we're trying to be able to get the world to get access to these incredible genes that have stunning, stunning chemotypes and really unique profiles and really start to, you know, bring the world of cannabis to the, to the average user in a way that lets them be differentiated so that, you know, if you, if you want to smoke gelato, you can, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're tired of smoking the same shit for the last seven years, then what do you do? Where, where do you, where are you sourcing it? Because basically everything being grown and bred primarily is worked off of populations that are safe to sell because you know, there's money. It's got to have some kind of gas. So it's either TK or an OG. You got to get some kind of candy. So you're going to have a Skittle or a gelato. You, you're, or you're going to throw a, maybe a cherry pie in there too. You, I mean, there's, you, you've got about seven or eight different colors of paint that the world uses to build varieties today. And the problem is that there's 10,000 colors of paint. And so we're telling people that they don't, they don't have the ability to choose their own colors. And for me, you know, getting this information out and being able to kind of expose the work and to highlight the the skills and the values of the land race team I worked with is critical, man, because the brothers were just nasty on skill sets, man. They were absolute hunters. They were running through the populations and they like they had they had bloodhound nose. It was it was a joy to work with them. So I have a few questions for you. Um, what was yeah, give me the- one favor. Let me sure. let me unplug this mic and let me plug a battery pack in so I don't run out of power. Hang on. Sure. I just, um, Daniel, welcome, welcome to the show. I don't, I, you know, never got a chance to welcome you. Um, how how was the hash? I, I mean, I'd love to hear about the hash culture there. I know that it's, it's huge hash culture, um, and also with mixing with tobacco, 
um i heard what was that like yeah yo so the hash culture for me my first impression was getting to the spot in islamabad and the first time our Freedy brother uh salamat does when he pops out the hash is this guy the uh, mic's over here so this guy starts to uh light it on a key takes a, a nice glob like it's probably four grams maybe five grams of hash pops it on there lights it up gets it warm puts it on the palm of his hand and starts smearing it smearing it and smearing it and clumping it and he's getting it ready for uh, mixing it with tobacco so the way the hash is handled uh, is completely different and i think it's representative of the relationship that's been there for so long and to me that was evident towards the end of the trip where I believe we are back in Islamabad and uh, homie uh, Saeed Dumer, uh, he rolled a hash cigarette like a professional dude. And I have the, we, uh, posted the video on Instagram. And so for me, um, that right there was a really cool first impression. And as Kev's saying, this is a culture that goes back thousands of years and is the genetic origin of the bro of Broadleaf, uh, you know, in in the world and uh, the cultures as well um, to see that live through the people, that pride, the dress, the language, because Saeed Umer does not speak English, you know, so there's a little bit of a language barrier. But nonetheless, um, it's just an experience that if you're really into cannabis, you're really into weed and you want to experience a place that this is where it all started, like you deserve to, to save up some money and head out with Let's Be Friends Pakistan Team Land Race Genetics to do a similar kind of trip. Because I can't say that, you know, the logistics to shuck seed while you're on the move, that's a high value thing. And I don't think that could be duplicated for tourists, normal, even for guys that are really in the game. And then even going to Thira, you know, going to Thira as an example, that was a mission. But at the moment, the region was unstable. So I made the decision to go by myself, which was a controversial decision. But nonetheless, uh, it's examples like that that, you know, I think for me, just having a giant brick, a kg of hash and all this weed while you're enjoying natural beauty and on the go. And only one day we're at Hopper Valley, just one day, you know, and everything else was a magnificent experience. So and the hospitability was like that, you know, something that just uh Imagine you're a kid going to Disneyland for the first time, meeting like Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. You're like, oh my, you're like, you're you're dizzy, right? Well, it's funny because uh, we were all like big kids enjoying bonfires, and it's that brotherhood, the hospitality that really, really made it special. And what I'll just say while I'm on the mic, real quick, is that the epiphany that I've been having is that in a world of division. And if if division can symbolize uh, divide and conquer, you know, because I know. I've read a lot of books and I don't mind uh, trying to lend my mind to the mentality of those that are in power to understand the way the world is. So if I was in those shoes, yeah, divide and conquer, that's the way to go, right? Uh, but on the other hand of that coin, you know, to unite creates an incredible power that is a totally different, you're not throwing money at the problem. It's just this natural, organic thing that I believe you can call her the goddess. Some of us call her the goddess, the plant. I believe the plant is guiding this. And I believe Allah, I believe the creator is guiding this. You know, when you say the creator, Allah, Jehovah, it's all, it's all the same, you know, it's all the same, you know, creator, you know? So it's just been a beautiful experience overall. So yeah, to answer your question, the hash was just a spiritual experience. You know, it was cool. And I, I could see it with Kev too, to just be wrapped up in their world, you know, and they did such a good job of it. They had never seen Indo, they had never seen flower. <laughs> People have been smoking hash and say, well, friggin' kids, when we broke out the bags of indoor, they were like, what the hell is that? Because they had never seen flour unseeded. They had never, it was the first time they'd ever seen it. So it was just so funny because, you know, we, we take genes from a region that makes hash and we grow weed with it. We're right. really, we should like, cause weed is really from South and Central America in terms of how we understand it, the Mexicans and the Colombians fed us that product. Interesting. You know what I'm saying? So like, and the reason being is that you can't keep plant material viable in ultra dry environments. It crumbles. 
whereas stuff in Colombia, Central America, Mexico, because of the moisture level, it holds. And so when we're talking about like aging cannabis, aging resin is good, but not aging hash plants, but aging plants that we would call, you know, narrow leaf drug cultivars, it works because the plant material itself was selected and developed and designed by the people. So the region shapes the reality. The people choose what works for them within that. And so that nexus between what can happen and what people want to happen is what creates what is. And so it was just, uh, it was, it was, it was really, you know, what, you know, what was really helpful was, um, all the books that I had read from Lawrence Cherniak and the, the books from Rob Clark on the history of hash. So, I mean, I had, I had done my homework on this shit for years and it was just really, it was beautiful to walk the grounds that these people that had come before us had walked and we got to experience the, the feel. It's just that when they were there, at least when Lawrence was there, it was, you know, in the seventies and it was a radically different environment. And we didn't have that same persecution towards these people. And so, you know, when, when, when you think about the regions, you're just like, holy shit, why would I want to go there? Because if you flew on a plane, the plane trip would cost you more than the vacation. And every time you ate food, you would be eating food that was just phenomenal. And anywhere you walked, you would basically be knocked out from the beauty. Like it, 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 I felt like there was a moment in time where like, I remember reading as a kid about the mountains singing, right? And so I live in the hills here, but I don't hear the mountains sing. I hear the wind. It sounds like the ocean to me. It reminds me of being out at sea. But we were out up in these, we were in these high, high deserts, some of the cold deserts, but we were in a mountain range nearby and there was this music that was coming out and I'm looking around to figure out where is this music coming from? And I realized it was the wind blowing through the mountains and it was creating music. It was creating not just a tone, but a complete range of sounds. And it was so profoundly beautiful that for a minute I couldn't speak. I, I didn't have the ability to enunciate what I was experiencing because I had gone back to 10 years old. When I was a kid, man, my life was fucked. And I escaped the world I was in through literature. And, and you know, you, you dream of being Thor Hyadrill. I wanted to be Thor Hyadrill. I wanted to be somebody who sailed the Contiki across the ocean and didn't know how to swim. Where Tor didn't give a shit if he was going to drown. Tor was going to recreate the trip on the balsa wood log around the Polynesia to show that these people had actually traveled the earth in a way. And so all these explorers that I was fascinated with as a kid and all the stories and the tales of the regions, they just stuck in my mind. But when you get to experience what it's like to be on the open ocean, it, it, now you understand what Tor felt like. When I was in the mountains... I got to understand what I'd read about and it caught me. I really couldn't talk. It was almost like the air wouldn't leave my mouth because I was just riveted to the experience. And I just think that anyone who wanted to travel to the region and experience um, that type of relationship with the world around you and be around people that no matter where you went, if you bumped into somebody, they smiled and they offered their hand to you to say hello. And if you happened to walk onto their farm or walk onto their property while you were hiking a trail, they would come up to you and say, hey, the apples on these trees are exceptionally good right now. You need to take as many as you can take with you for your friends. Shit isn't happening here. You, you can't pick apples over the fence from your neighbor's yard. I mean, we're good and humble. Like, I think we have a pretty, really beautiful world here. But in general, that's just not our society. And so it was just really refreshing to get to realize that you could live like that if you wanted to. And so it, it was a desire and the, the effort that the land race team and Let's Be Friends Pakistan put out was absolutely, I mean, it, it was easy. It was a seven month project to coordinate it. There was not one moment we weren't experiencing something. We went to this desert, right? One of the highest cold mountain deserts in the world. And we go out in these off-road Jeeps. And I think that we, and there's five of us in the back of the Jeep, right? And I think that we're going to, the guy's on a cell phone and he's driving. And I think we're going to go for some casual cruise through this, this mountainous desert. 
And this dude puts the phone down, clicks his shit into gear, and floats this Jeep off the top of this dune where the whole Jeep flew through the air. And we're all looking at each other laughing because we're like, we're all going to die. This dude was floating this thing. And I mean a a desert with dunes that were like right out of it. Close your eyes and think you're in Arabia. That kind of shit. It was that big. And this, these Jeeps are shooting down these canyons that are hundreds of feet. And then you're roaring up the top and we're all hanging on the back. And you're, 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 you're laughing because you're like, well, we're going to have a good time, but at least we're going to die as a crew. And we stopped at the top of a big dune and we hung out. And I sent some of those pictures to you. Look at the area around you. You're, you're in places where the, you're just surrounded by mountain ranges where I'm sitting there smoking a joint of hash and to the right of me is a sandstorm blowing in and to the left of me is a snowstorm blowing into the mountain. So you're watching sandstorms and snowstorms simultaneously based off of the altitude of where your view is. I just got to say also, Kev, that, yeah, when I took that hop in the Jeep, they were like, Kev was like, use both hands, use both hands. <laughs> and, yo, my my thing is that my driver, same driver as Kev, I'm like, this motherfucker's possessed by a gin. This fool's driving like he's just doesn't, he's like on the run from the fucking law and then some. That's how you feel like you're in a James Bond movie. Like, it was what that real. the <laughs> fuck is going on? You're literally gripping so fucking tough to the frame around that Jeep. These guys are pro drivers, dude, on these giant sand dunes. It was the most thrilling thing that I've experienced in such a long time. Cause in my mind, I'm like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to hold on. And like, I'm, we're on the run and fuck it. Hey, you know, and then I thought to myself, if you have a, a big rifle in one hand, the skills that it would take to fucking, you know, be in a, a, a gunfight, you know, just my imagination, you know, being a fucking go, like I kept saying, going back to like a 10 year old boy and shit, how funny, but man, like. I think a great way to summarize it, these guys did a great job of helping us live in the moment, like be in the moment, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it was a Safaranga cold desert at that moment. So that to me was definitely a highlight, Kev. I'm glad you remembered. And and the stars, you know, we went to go check out the the night sky, that shit. I've never seen nothing like that. Yeah, it was gorgeous. We went out to that. We're we're lucky here in Humboldt, though. Like, no matter, I've, I've been all over the world. Humboldt is unique, too. And that's what I was showing pictures to the guys there saying, hey, when you come visit us, I'll get to show you what a 350 foot tree looks like because we're the only place that has it. And so you can't deny Humboldt's utter awe when you're in it. And so I'm fortunate that I live in a place that's that unbelievable. But the 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 scale of what we saw made everything I'm used to look minuscule. There was no word for the scale of it. We went in, we went in like so, certain mountains were just absolute collections of, of rock where you I mean every color you can imagine. And you can see where the uprising from the, there's three Teutonic plates merged there. So it creates this incredible pressure, just like Humboldt. Humboldt's three Teutonic plates merging, which creates our incredible diverse terrain. Same thing in the Himalaya, Kurukuram and Hindu Kush mountains, they're colliding and it drives it up. But then there's like strips and pockets and they're saying, hey, those colors indicate rubies. And you would look and you would see these caves punched into the mountain where they had come down on ropes to dig in and get the rubies. But we go to one mountain and it's pure marble. I mean, white. And we got to go inside the marble caves where they were mining the marble. And man, it was a trip to go inside a marble cave because you're inside the mountain and you just like, it was white. The purest white not a single inflection of any color. We got to meet along that river. Um, so the, the Indus is the, is the river that's the massive river. There's the Gilgit and all these other rivers that feed into it. Incredible gold mining. And so the village sends the team from the village to live alongside the river. And they cover like a mile or two of riverside at, at one time. And then they, they, they hand wash it and then they move. And we got to watch people mining gold, sifting gold. And I'm like, we were watching gold flake pouring out of the pan. So it was the first time in my life I really ever got to see somebody actually swirling a pan and having gold emerge. And there was ruby and emerald and blue tourmaline. I found these stunning crystal stones when we were hiking up to the glacier. It was Every, every, every rock on planet earth is there. It's crazy. And everything's made out of stone. So all the homes are made out of stone and now they're using, you know, cement, but 
you got to see homesteads in the mountains that were, you know, Christ, they could have been a thousand years old. All the stone walls to contain the goat, the ancient rock. They build them in these two levels and all the doors are half height. So this way they, they trap the warm air in the upper part of the, the chamber because the wintertime it's savagely cold. And so you got to see how they figured out how to preserve food, how to, how to maintain climate and temperature inside buildings. You got to, they bring all the animals into the, the, the floors below the house. So the pens are below it so that the warmth of the animal warms the floor, warms the people. And it's this, this goal is to survive this three or four month winter. And then when the winter's over, you go into spring, summer, and fall. And in all these regions, it's some of the most incredibly beautiful weather, balmy, I mean, holy shit, if anybody that wanted to travel and take a vacation and you wanted to be able to save some money, go to Pakistan and and skip the city. The cities were incredible. We went to Lahore too. We ended up in Lahore. And Lahore, I think, is like 14 million people. But what was a trip was in every one of these cities, right, No, nobody follows the traffic lanes. So like you're supposed to have like three lanes. Instead, you got six cars wide. And you got like 50 motorcycles around you and 50 like rickshaws and then six packs of goats. And then there's a dude in a pickup truck with two lions in the back of it. And then there's cats on motorcycles with monkeys. And I mean like a million cars at once flying and they all communicate with the horn. And how they tap the horn lets the people in front of you know, are you going to the left or the right of them? And there wasn't a single traffic light. There wasn't a single stop sign. They, nobody followed any lanes and they all drive at around like 35, 40 miles an hour. So it's functional. And you're just looking at a city where every block is another type of production or region. It was so unbelievably complicated and alive that the only place, two places on earth reminded me of it, Athens, Greece, which was when, I, when you go to Athens itself, it's, it's, it's packed and Mexico City. Until you experience Mexico City, holy shit, you don't really catch what busy is. And Lahore stood right next to any of them, except nobody had any violence. There was no issues. It was moving. And we ended up going to this beautiful restaurant on top of a building. It used to be the old red light district, right? So they used to be where all the prostitutes were back in the day, kind of like Vegas. Vegas had all the prostitutes on the strip and they kicked them all out and then they corporatized Vegas. So Lahore cleans up a region and now it's just all the beautiful buildings that used to be the red light. And we were looking over a mosque that was about 600 years old, built by the moguls. So when people talk about you're a business mogul, the moguls were a race of people. They were a culture. And this mosque was massive. It was one of the biggest mosques in all of Pakistan. And so when you look at a, a building that would rival any building of today, but it was made 600 years ago by hand. It, it's, it's, and I was a builder when I was young. And so for me to see some of the craftsmanship and the work and the thoughtfulness and the, the, the adaptation to the environment and how it absolutely impacted them, it was unreal. What's up, baby? Hey, new me. What you got, new dog? Me, bye. <laughs> good, man. Good. Talk to us, brother. Woo! Oh shit! There he goes. <laughs> you go. you got embarrassed. But the 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 team on both sides was just wonderful, man. I I really enjoyed the time I got to spend in the rig. So Danny, Ralph, and John, and and Ralph and John, man, like I've worked with Ralph before. Ralph and Danny worked together on GW Smoke Break, and he's a really talented uh, photographer, videographer, and he's just a really sh sharp dude. But this is the first time I met John, and John's a filmmaker. And so while we were there, John got an honorable mention at a film festival for like one of his first releases. And so it was cool because you're getting to celebrate somebody's film success while they're there with you filming. And he just had a wonderful time. And what, what was cool was he has Pakistani friends that had got him set up with like official clothing, customs. He knew the dance. He had done video work with people. And so when he showed up, he had like the gear and the, the locals fell in love with them, man. When he broke out his shit, they were just like, whoa, because he knew the dance. He had the right shit. And he was just the sweetheart of a kid, too, man. I think he's young, like 25. 
but uh, just a sweetheart of a kid. And the people just absolutely loved him. And he was capturing the work with Ralph and Danny, but also they were all capturing their own pieces. Danny captured stuff, Ralph captured stuff, John captured stuff. And then they all captured together to create like the interview series. And so what we did here is like, I didn't do any media work here. And we let, we let GW handle all the media. So what we had was one platform handling all media. And then I have an idea of what I want to do with my side of the story. And it's not, it's not that it's my side is a different side than their side. It's just that because of my relationship with Doug, my relationship with Humboldt, my relationship with genetics, and it lets me, it lets me approach it from a different perspective where really I'm trying to, to, to take that into that next level where Doug builds the world we're in. And I'm trying to see if I can help move it back into a circle of um, reciprocity. Can I can I jump in for, for one second? Yeah. So something that you, you had said earlier was that Doug had gone to Pakistan in the 70s, pulled a certain set of genetics and that you had um, kind of looked through those specific traits. You were kind of you were coming back to see if things similar were still there. Yeah, and the DNA, it, and the DNA, it. and they were the descriptions that he sent, both of the seeds that he gathered. So, in terms of like what was the modeling, what was the patterning, what was the size, you still saw the diversity, and then also what was the morphology and what was the characteristics of the plant. And so, um, the populations have stayed pretty constant because when we're talking to the locals, we're like. Are you still working? Because there's no need to lie to us. We're all hanging out, you know, chilling in a hut, smoking ash. They're like, no, we got the same genes. So what you have is a genetic purity. And the idea is hopefully when we do the DNA analysis, we can analyze, did we actually find, man, I got a little land race love for you right there too, brother. Um, We can try to find, are the relationships still present? But at the end of the day, what what I what I what I have on one of the packages is that when we went to Tira, um, it was it was risky for the locals for anybody who wasn't local to be there due to some of the political unrest, and so when they went in to grab Saeed and bring him back, Numi goes and gets a photo of him with what he thought was the best plant that he saw at the patch, and he gets a photo of him with the plant, gathers the seeds, hands them to me, and says he's laughing. I risked death for these, and so that's what I wrote on the package. I risk death for these seeds because in the actual truth, you do when you're in any kind of area that's turbulent. And so what you had was a commitment to the, to, to the desire to see something better that transcended your own safety, that transcended your own comfort. There was like no time where we weren't treated better. Like we ate first, our shit was carried and it wasn't, you know, you man, like my friends are good to me. So I'm fortunate. I have a really solid crew here in the U.S. And so I, I'm used to being treated well. It was like a family relationship and you can't fake it when it lasts 20 days. And so what you had was you had the, the understand, which is what you need. See, like we focus on the weed, but we don't focus on the culture. The culture steers the herb. The region determines what can and cannot live there. The people determine what they want from that existing population. And so the human and the region collide to create the reality. And what I needed to see was what was the fucking reality? Because I live in the weed, but I didn't understand the reality. I didn't understand what it was like. That's why I brought back all the soil samples. I took We had eight collection sites we went to over the course of like a 12 hour day. We, the six, there was, we were all there filming and working, but six of us were actively hunting. And I collected a soil sample from every single one of these places so that we can do an, an essay and start to take a look and say, hey, what is the soil that has been producing this cannabis for a long time? Because they're not using any artificial amendments. They're not adding any urea. They're not adding MPK. They're not adding any kind of um, nothing. It's basically the cultivation practices that have occurred since millennia ago. So it's it's really pretty awesome. And it's good to see my boy's face looking good. It's it's been it's been a it, it's been a it's been an absolute pleasure, man. I, I am good. I am good. Yeah, it's good, good, brother. Say hi to the boys, man. Say what's up to Hami and, and, and Cali. What up, new me? How you doing, man? Yeah.
I'm good. How are you, Danny? Good. Awesome, man. I'm happy that you're on here, dude. Let us know how it's been yeah, since I'm the trip that, for right. you, dude. It's an how, how has it been for you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All good. All good. For sure, man. Uh, really excited to be back. Oh, and thank you. Thank you, Numi. Thank you 100%. You know? Yeah, that's Land Race Genetics. And so welcome. Team Land yeah, Race is, is the three brothers. And the 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 three brothers... Man, it was it was it was it was beautiful to be able to be part of that family. Like I, I took that home with me, and so I I, I signed my hashtags now fifth brother, <laughs> and I'm grateful, man. It was just an absolute joy to get yeah, to work with you guys. You, Another question that I had for you guys was um, yeah, we are we are grateful to you guys. Um, question: Were there any? like different kinds of fruits or vegetables that you guys had a chance to eat while you were there or like a different take on, you know what I mean? Like an apple, but it's, you know, it's, it's slightly different. Cause I mean, for, for me as like a pheno hunter, it's like, we're looking for like the same thing, but you know, slightly different variations on it from, you know, cultural and environmental. Totally. What, what I learned when I went to, like when I went to Greece, you got to remember that like when you're in Pakistan, what you're in is you're in a region that is really been populated by the, the people that were local to the area, which would be Indians, you know, the India, Afghani, just take away the names, create a cluster. And then Genghis Khan out of China, Mongolia, and then Alexander the Great from Europe. And so this collision of all these cultures populates these areas with all these different fruits and foods. So when I went to Greece the first time, I realized that all the fruit that we're eating in the U.S. is not indigenous to the U.S. It's indigenous there. So once you have a fig in Greece, you're like, it's a different fig than the one here. And so that was the difference. It was that if you buy walnuts in the U.S., you have to kind of soak them in water to pull some of the tannins out to increase the sweet aspects of the nut meat. And you didn't have to do that there. And the shells were like stone. I mean, you had to bust that shit. The apples, same thing, green and red. You have two different divisions, right? Green and red. Every field had green and red, green and red. But what you had was a much higher fruit density. And when you ate it, you were fuller. And so if that's what I wish I could have brought back the food too for analysis, because what we have is a food supply that's completely non-existent in terms of nutrient load. And so what you have is people eating to the point of obesity, but they're starving to death at the same time, right? Which is the irony of that is mind bending, right? When you ate an apple there, you were good to keep hiking up a mountain. So it was, it was like the peaches were just absolutely sugar. What, what caught me most was they took us to this place on a lake. So this huge giant mountain lake, like equivalent to like Lake Tahoe in size, an earthquake dammed a river and flooded a canyon that was called Atabad Lake. Atabad yeah, Lake. Lake. And so you go to this lake and there was this restaurant on the lake and they said, Kev, you got to try this apricot juice. It's legendary here. And it was like someone had taken the richest, ripest apricots on planet earth and crushed them and pulped them and put them into a container for you. And when you were drinking it, you were so happy and you knew you couldn't drink too much because you're going to get gas and shit. And you're going to be in a car driving for hours. Right? And so you had to, you know, you can't drink too much fruit juice in life. It was unbelievable. The dried fruit, we were buying bags of dried apricots and cherries for like three bucks. You can't buy a ring of apricots at the store for under seven. I'm talking bags for like three bucks. And it was just, there was a, a different type of sweetness. There was subtleties that just made you realize that this is just like with the herb. This is where it came from. It adapted. So we take it and do what we do. But I, I eat really well here. Like my girl's a, a, a organic fanatic. And so I call her like a new age hippie. And so everything we eat has like no preservatives. It's all really fresh. She's always growing produce in the yard. We're having fresh salad all the time from the yard. She's making sure that everything is as clean and good as can be and farmers markets. And so like, you can't, I don't think you can get any better quality food than I'm eating at my house here in California, in California, but it was different than what I experienced there because it was all about nutrient density. Their mineral load in the soil is never endingly replenished. The glaciers keep pushing 
keeps pushing, the Indus keeps flowing, these, these, they, they send the water through to irrigate, and it's depositing never-endingly new fresh loads of minerals at a diversity level that's unparalleled. So like, that's why I wanted the soil samples. The soil samples will let us understand better, like what's really driving this development. I mean, if I got lucky that like, like I bet 18 years ago, I hooked up with some dude that was a wealthy winery owner and we became friends and he said, Hey, you can use my lab to do leaf analysis. And so I would shred the leaf so that you didn't know it was pot and I'd send it to him and we did leaf analysis. And it let me realize then that the formulas we were using with cannabis and for hydroponics was too much, too much nitrogen, not enough manganese and zinc and magnesium. And so I knew that once they modified the Hoagland mix to reflect that, you start to have steered nutrition for cannabis in, in chemical form. And whether I'm not, I'm not arguing chemical good, chemical bad, I don't give a fuck right now. This, this discussion is about the reality of agriculture, that most food is produced in this manner, and that cannabis was utilizing a, an old school Hoagland formula, which was the base of most modern hydroponic formulas, and I said, at some point when they tailor it. So for me, it allowed me to start tailoring my work. I was able to drop my end loads down in the salts and I was able to boost manganese, zinc and magnesium. And I ended up getting a radically different product. And it put me ahead of the game in terms of competitive advantage. Now what you have is you have like, you know, a couple companies like Athena, Front Range, uh, King Solomon, all of those guys use steered lines where they adjusted the, the makeup of the nutrition to better reflect cannabis so that you're growing more, more, more flower material, less biomass leaf. And you're allowing the plant to be able to stack a little better because you're not loading so many ions of one type into where it precludes uptake of others, right? So for me, as an outdoor cultivator, primarily, I wanted to know what was the mineral loads, you know, and I maybe, hopefully maybe the microbial loads just try to understand what's the organisms that we, we see here. And it, it's, it's just trying to understand, you know, when I was younger, it was always about trying to control. I wanted to be like in control of my cultivation because it made you feel good to be in control. And the older you get, the less control you have, really. That's what you kind of understand in life is that it's really out of fucking control. And that, and that working with that lack of control is really the peace you find. And as an outdoor, outdoor cultivator, it's kind of where I, I decided to spend the latter part of my life was growing outdoor versus indoor is where I'd spent all the early years of my career. And it was because I wanted to experience that, that a natural vibe. I wanted to understand what it was like to be like a healthy, regenerative farmer. I wanted to learn and understand. And I knew that it was a process and it was going to take me my whole life to realize. And without being able to go to the places where people have done this for time, you just kind of don't have the background. You're I'm, 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 I'm thinking something, but I, I'm not knowing something. And so when I got there, it let me understand that these regions produced a fertility and a quality that was so great that it launched the world. The cannabis industry we're in today was really built from genes in Pakistan. Because when we, when we, you can't grow pure Colombian or Mexican any, at anything over like 35 latitude, right? So with 39, it's, I'm trying to, I'm running some Colombian Cambodians right now. I'm praying that the weather doesn't go back to rain, right? It's a fucking nightmare right now. It's a shit season, really, for long cycle herb. So you really can't run them. And so we were forced to go into these shorter stature plants due to law enforcement. We were forced to go into stockier stuff, things that, that, that chunked up and produced a little bit more aggressive high due to law enforcement. And, and that takes the world over. Like California, Humboldt shaped California, California shapes the rest of the U.S. The U.S. shapes the rest of the world's opinion. And it's not U.S. like we're better. It's just that we pretty much people copy people copy what we do because we have the media. We have the ability to get stories out. We have the ability to create movies and, and, and things that reach into other worlds that most people don't. And so how do you really like get an education when you're constantly being taught that we're influencing the world. And so the older I get, the more I'm trying to go back down this timeline of what built my life. Where did I, where did I get the desire from? And, and when I work with the plants, what's the connection to it? And so me being able to explore the Americas was incredible because it let me really understand 
the root of American consumption, because most of the herb coming into the U.S. was Mexican Colombian, you know, in the in, in 1900s. 1920, we get into the drug war. We start to knock it out. But at that time, all narrow leaf cultivars moving up. And then you start to have the export come into the hash trade and weed. But the genes, the genes that built Humboldt, that built the America, all came from Pakistan. And to be able to go touch those people and touch those places and eat the food and and sit there and, and understand that like you're stocking seed because it's going to be a cold winter and you need to eat. And you need to make sure you have enough cannabis put away as, as a immune system stimulator because now we understand the endocannabinoid system. We understand that humans were shaped through these products. The evolution of humans. That's that whole, that's the whole stoned ape. That's McKenna's theory that, you know, once the monkeys started eating mushrooms, human beings started to evolve. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily true because I'm not qualified to have that opinion if it's true or not. But the premise, the premise of how did humans evolve and develop, every human has an endocannabinoid system. Every mammal has an endocannabinoid system. You have it in mollusks, for Christ's sakes. You have a system that predates the immune system directly connected to these products. And to see how they used it in their lives so completely, and then you see the duration of their lives, and you start to understand like, whoa, how do we integrate it into our life in this manner? How do, how do we really take cannabis and use it in a way that allows all to benefit in a way that isn't just psychoactive only, but holistic? And then what it does now is it gets us out of the psychoactive only group, which isn't a problem because that's where I live, but it allows you to be able to touch a far greater audience and create a far greater relevance. And maybe that starts to create the idea that we need to be more protective of the genes. We need to be able to understand the cultures that created these habits, these consumption methodologies. They preserve the genes. How do you, how do you help them maintain their autonomy so that we don't bottleneck a gene supply to where we go through the, uh, the banana issue or the potato issue? Right. Because you got you got the Cavendish banana, right? The the one banana that can survive the banana blight. But the beauty of the Cavendish was it ships well. So it didn't mean that it tasted good. It means that it survived the blight and it ships well. So every banana you eat in the store is a Cavendish banana because based off that reality, that doesn't mean that it's the best choice. And I think with cannabis, we're really going that route quickly. Yeah. I mean, I think it also comes into the necessity for peace in the world because, I mean, these in these areas, if there's, you know, constant wars, it's difficult for people to survive and keep their genetics alive. And, you know, it's incumbent upon us as U.S. citizens, I mean, I'll say it, to be stewards of peace in the world and to, you know, not to be afraid to to talk about peace and you know, letting other peoples of the world live their lives be, um, because it's hard to to be a farmer and live in, in many different places in the world. And, um, you know, I'm sure because of destabilization, a lot of these genetics, you know, are being lost. Oh, totally. Look at us in the U.S. though, right? We don't have, I mean, the U.S. is siloed as a nation. I mean, you got two oceans on the side. You got Canada and Mexico below us. So, like, geographically, we're a nightmare to fucking contend with. So we don't get invaded. And the last time we got invaded, we they got repelled, and, and here we are. So what we have is an internal issue. We have the American drug war. And the American drug war just ripped this country to pieces and created complete, complete fractures within families, within communities, and it, it, for me, it, it, like I went on this skunk hunt for a couple of years because I was trying, I wanted to go back and dig up my youth. I wanted to go back in time and see if I could find the things that I enjoyed smoking when I was younger, like, you know, teenager up to like early twenties. And I had this incredible collection of these type of plants that I lost in a, a combined fucking, I had, we had a raid at my house that took the, the library. And then some morons thought my buddy's op was a, a production op, but really was just, a, it was the mom base. And he had an armed robbery where they came in. And once they realized it was no weed, they just were like, well, let's just take the plants. And so they took the redundant copies. 
So I lose this collection of skunks that was incredible. I had this, I had, I had a lot of different plants, but I had the old skunk lines that were just absolutely disgustingly pungent. And I lost them in like 2001, right? So 22 years ago, I lose the plants. So like seven years ago, I, I start diving into all these old populations I'm receiving from people and we start trying to dig it up. And I was publicizing it saying, hey, I'm going to go hunt the skunk. And what I wanted was I wanted people to hunt the skunk. I wanted not just me to hunt it. I don't give a fuck who finds it. What I want is I want to see people go and look and dig and find and explore and participate. And I dug and I dug and I dug and I dug and I, I reached a point where I just couldn't find it. And so I took a break mentally because I said to somebody, I said, you go down deep enough down the rabbit hole, you run out of air. And there's a point where you can only dig so far. And so the thing is, when you're somebody like me, you can access genes like, you know, the, the shit's on the shelf. And you got people all over the world you're screwing with trying to, you know, can we find anything? And 20 fucking years of, of time since I've seen that stuff, where is it? And, and it's, it's not an argument because people always say, I have it. But that's a business pitch. The reality is produce it and put it on the table and show somebody and let them confirm it. Like, honestly... Where is it? And so it just means that the drug war was so effective in America that we wiped shit out that you just can't find. And maybe there's a piece of it left somewhere, but we did the same damage. And so maybe stock that we have that's priceless needs to be maintained in other countries just like we maintain theirs. So like I helped the farms in Afghanistan in a regard by bringing attention to their world but they get knocked out. So there's no benefit to them now. The only benefit is that we, they didn't lose the genes that their families have been cultivating for centuries because we were able to spread them. And I didn't make a business out of it. And neither did, neither did, neither did that group with me. They said, could you please help? And I said, I think I can. I think I can get many people to get these genes in their hands so that what we're doing is we're creating a living bank. And I kind of look at it like coral where all the coral reefs are getting destroyed. And so I got a friend that's a coral enthusiast and I was just fascinated with the whole coral trade where they, they trade frags all over the world, fragments of coral glued to glass and they grown. And he's like, Kev, he goes, there's more diversity in hobbyist tanks right now than there might be in the ocean because we've destroyed so much of the reef material. And so at the end of the day, you can't protect everything, but the idea that you're trying helps your children understand that there's a future ahead of them that they can participate in as well. It's, it's deeper than just the genes. It's the practices. It's that you're showing them that you can look into the future and that by being thoughtful, you can absolutely slow down change to where it moves in an, an organic manner. But when we have like, you know, a, a corporate policy come in or you have a drug war or you have, you know, uh, instability in a country, it's an ax that comes down and chops that shit right off. And then what we have now is a total break in our culture and a total break in the genetic integrity. And when I was young, I didn't understand it as well because, you know, you're young. But the older you get, the more you realize that all you're going to do is leave a legacy. And what legacy do you want to leave? Like, how do you want to be remembered? And if you can do something positive and one person benefits and then that person does something positive, you were a link in a chain that went on forever. And that's some real shit. And I think that that's really what caught me with this project was that Team Land Race and Let's Be Friends Pakistan, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to recreate a world where people could reciprocate and function collaboratively. And then they brought a team in and I mean, me and Danny been hanging out for 20 years. Right. So I knew, I knew the walrus is cool and I know Ralph is solid, but I'd never met John or met Jamie or met Imran or met, and I knew Neil from some work we do together. And so having, having all these guys together was crazy and Neil and Imran are music freaks. So Neil used to be um, with Sony and Imran is a nasty, like dancer, like a professional you know, like a street dancer. And so being in the car with these two dudes had the greatest playlist in human history. So we had music that was popping. Neil was breaking out shit that he's like, no one's ever heard this track. The music company wouldn't pick up the artist because they were too ugly, but this shit is raw. And he was, I mean, we were listening to fresh music for 10 hours a day, rolling through the mountains. And it was just a joy, man. The, the guys couldn't have been any nicer. 
So it was it was just like you you it almost made you feel like you were a little kid back when you were you know nine years old and you went played in the neighborhood with your friends and and when you went when you went over to your friend's mom's house she made you sandwiches and when you went and went to the store the people at the store knew who you were because you were the neighborhood kids and they would give you some candy and they would be nice it was like that everywhere we go the team had gathered up a big fucking container of lollipops and goodies. So every time little kids were running up to see strangers, they got little goodies and they, and they got a little hug and then the kids were just ecstatic. And it made me feel like I was a little kid because it was just so pure. It was, uh, it was a common goal. And when you get to do things in common, you can do some stuff. And if there's a little bit of struggle, like, you know, getting in a landslide, it kind of brings you together. We got any good questions on the chat, man? I'm not following the chat, but I, I every now and then I pop to it. But like I said, there's the whole team should be it should be involved in it too. So anybody who wants to chat with them, I would love to be able to get the squad we were with, uh, you know, introduced into the world in a way that's good for them and the people because we're all in the same boat. Your craft cultivator, baby, you you are in the same boat. You got a lot of pressure on top of you. And the only way that you're going to really be able to, to achieve the goal of autonomy is through unity. You're no man's an island and you're going to have to do it with others. And the ability to do it with people in other countries that are trying to do the same thing is just a gift. You know, just an absolute gift. This is a good grass too. I just, I just, uh, uh, I came home to some of my own outdoor harvesting. So I'm stoked because it's harvest season and there's some fresh in my family, bless my girl and her sister. They uh, kept their eye on the crop while I was gone and I got home and I'm, and I'm smoking some killer red lab puck right now. That's nasty. <laughs> I was so, just going to ask you about oh, that bro. stuff. It sounds, it sounds pretty interesting. It's good. It's good. I, when I, when I, I mean, I love Bob, man. He's just a talented breeder. I met him years ago. And it was before he was crickets and he was, they, his nickname was the librarian because he held all the original cuts. Right. And so I get introduced to him and I just respected the shit out of him because he was like about his craft. And so we maintained this friendship over the years and he, um, he gets into some of the puck work, which is, which is really incredible. Like a five year line breeding operation where we took multiple hash plants and then wove them together to get what he was desiring based off of that skelly cut. So in order for him to create a cut that wasn't feminized, like a line that wasn't feminized, he had to go weave in other lines because the skelly's a cut, right? There's no male to go with it. And so he goes and he puts all these hash plants in steering towards the goal of recreating the mother plant, but in seed form. And he just fucking kills it. And he brings out those old basement funky terps, right? Those, those musky, dirty, smelly sock kind of scents that used to be prevalent in the 90s. And for me, that was like, you know, I was in it then. And so it took me back in time. And I loved all the hybrids he did. But there was something about that red leb combination that just absolutely caught me. And so I dug into the red leb and, and he had got the cut from Bam. And Bam had got it from his um, uh, friend and his friend had given him the red leb and a Burmese at the same time. I think there was like a raid or an issue and they gave it to Bam to hold. So Bam only knows the provenance from a friend of mine gave it to me. No backstory past that. But that red leb was like the single most resin crusted plant, you know, he'd ever seen in his life. And when they laid it into that skelly or that puck, it, it brought some really cool profiles forward that were like cinnamon, cedars, rose oils. And I was just like, holy shit. So the sample Bob smoked me was screaming. So I get four packs of seeds from him and I open pollinate the 56 seeds. So there was like uh, 26 male, 30 female. So what it did is it just gave me a big gene grab. And then I had now like, you know, 10,000 seeds. So I go through a couple hundred of these looking for that flavor that I had smoked with him. And it was a recessive trait. And that shit, man, was like one out of a hundred. And so I was able to finally found the female that reflected that exact profile with the minimized puck. Like I like the, I like the basement funk, but I like it as a background, not as a front note. And I found the male that reflected the same profile. 
And so it took me like a year and a half of digging through populations and hunting and then making sure I took the males and the females deep into the cycle to see if there would be any intersex. And so when I was done, what I had was this population that was killer and I found what I wanted. But in the process, I found four other plants that could stand on their own. I don't give a fuck what room you put them in. They were screaming. They just had different facets. And so either more fruity, more floral, more earthy, but all with that basement funk in the background but screaming and beautiful morphology and beautiful resin and like all the characteristics you want in kill weed. And the part that's cool is someone was asking me, you know, you got to go do a COA. And I was like, man, fuck a COA. It's exactly the opposite of why I'm doing the project. I'm not trying to put the plants into the commercial market. I don't give a shit. I do that for a living. That shit's fucking dry, man, because you're, you have a ceiling that says if it can't make it through the visual, if it can't make it through the numbers, if it can't make it through the time, if it can't make it through the fucking yield per square meter, it can't be here. And so what you have is production primarily as your first indicator. And as a smoker, what I'm looking for is experience. So yes, it needs to work. But what I want is just cracking ass weed that doesn't fit a selection criteria meant for today's legal market, because I don't really fucking care. And then put this product out in, into the hands of people so they can go dig through it. And, and if we can neck the populations, because at the end of the day, selection is really about the parental stock, not what you pulled from it, which is an interesting point about the crops in Pakistan. They leave all the females. It's the males that they cull. They go through the, in Afghanistan too, they go through the fields and they cut the males that they think are undesirable. And what they're looking for is good morphology, a combination of green and purples. So you have both colors because at the end of the day, purples resist frost better, different profiles. Purple's almost always more of a pomegranate, nut paste, sweet. Greens are almost always more of a disgusting, rotting meat, musky, funky, dirty shoe. But it's about survivability. So they select based off of good quality builds so the plants can hold up. So there's a good frame and then it's diversity in color and then a diversity in characteristics that they think are excellent. Gritty, oily, extremely pungent, prolific seed production, heavy flower. All of those things become the criteria, but the male selection is how they steer it. And so that's kind of what I'm working with on that pup work is that I spent a year and a half digging through the lines to find the male that I wanted to use as a a steering male. I took multiple males and made the F3 preservation. That's just me banking genes so I can go dig through a bigger pool later. But then I said, okay, now that I have a preservation of what I do, six males in that, including the one that I wanted, but the other ones were beautiful puck doms. So I said, all right, put them together. Let's hold the work. Take this male that I think that's just absolutely stellar where they, it reeked and was covered in resin. It, it reflected everything I wanted from that time I spent with Bob. So I want to jump in. Um, Red Lab, my, um, somebody in my family who, who is uh, um, in their 60s loved Red Lab hash and they're from Philly. Is this similar to that kind of? Well, it would be from that similar gene pool, but at the end of the day, red means it imparted colors from the soil. Okay. So red lev didn't mean like it had red hairs. It was a red plant. It means the hash was red, but it was really because the resin had a color based off of the minerals in the soil. So the soil minerals reflected in the resin coloration. And, and I've ran through a shitload of Lebanese populations and they're always kind of cool because they're quick. But I have never had one that had this level of quality. And I haven't got to fuck with the actual pure lab. Like, I, I think I could get my hands on it if I dug. But what I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take that quality of that red lab profile, but add the basement. And what I like is I like, I like complexity, right? So, like, I want, I want to smoke herb that I don't get bored with. And the only way that can happen is if it surprises me all the time when I smoke it, where I'm like, ooh, there's a note that I didn't expect. Ooh, there's a there's a, a flavor swirl that I can't describe. That way I'm always stoked on smoking. If it's just mono note shit, I get bored. So if it's just all orange, all tangerine, all cherry, all grape, all gas, 
it's great. And then you're like, all right, I'm bored. Like it's the same fucking gas, same fucking grape every single time. What I want is I want the grape and the gas, but I want them woven together so that they come out in waves on the mouth. When you smell them, it's waves. It's, it's complicated. It takes a minute for you to describe it. You can't easily identify it. I like that kind of shit, right? And so I think a lot of smokers do. And so that's what I'm really seeking is to take that red Lebanese profile and the, the blistering high, but put that, that body funk in it from the, the, the skelly and give it some of that thickness in the back of the mouth. So the exhale leaves that paint, leaves that sticky goo. And so far it's doing it. The outdoor is good. And, um, the, uh, the, I'm doing a final indoor selection where like I, I rerun them twice. So, you know, if you're going to like commit to a project, it's make sure you run it, make sure you run it one more time to confirm your selection. Just make sure that if you chose those six out of the package, run the six by themselves independently. Now just take a really clear look and make sure like, do you really want to go into these directions? And so I'm in day 35, day, th what, day 37 now. And so I figure, you know, 60, 65, we should be in that finish. And then I can um, let them sit for a minute and stabilize. And then that'll absolutely let me know. And I already have all the clones cut and I'm bringing it forward. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that LAPK cut that I just had forever. And I had actually lost the copy and I got it, I got it back from um, uh, Bone. And so Boneyard hooked me up with uh, my old PK back clean. So uh, completely screened for any viroid. And so I have this stellar, stunning copy of some of my most favorite herb I ever smoked sitting. And I'm going to lay that red leb dominant male into that and into those other red leb cuts. And that's what I'm going to throw out for that first release come springtime. And it's funny because uh, I was so caught up with that damn Marcour that I wanted to create another label that was like goat brand because I, I, I wanted to bring one home. I'm serious. Like a little kid, I wanted to have like a little Marcour and bring it home so I could have it on the roof of the house. And then it would be in my yard and I would be hanging out with my Marcour. The mountains do some crazy shit to you, man. It fucking makes you, it makes your inner weirdo come out, but um, in a healthy way, in, in the absolute best way. Does anybody got any questions on the chat they want to chop up? You got anything you uh, want to throw out? We got a live, but it looks like we got like 600 comments right here. Uh, the whole team are in chat. They want to ask a lot of questions. I'm not in the chat as well. Bokashi wants to hear about the soil. It was, it was interesting. It felt like really good loam, but gritty. So like the, it, it, you almost think about it like, like alluvial floodplains, right? Where the, you know, the rivers replenish the soil, except this was all glacial floodplains. And so the glaciers carve this shit and put up, you know, I would love to have bored down into it and taken like an index out and then measured it as a, as a, as a pipe, you know? But I, when I get the, when I get the uh, results, um, I'll get, I'll get you some copies. Cause I've got eight, I got eight. And you gave me the name of the lab. I think it was Logan labs. So it is branded from, um, uh, 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 Grokashi. Um, you sent me the info for what lab you use. So I'll probably hit them guys up and then get them sent out. And that'll give us analysis of what we're looking at. But it was, it was loamy, but it was gritty too. Like minerally gritty. Uh, um, I should send you a little in a Ziploc bag so you can feel it. You'll feel what I'm saying. It's not like, it's not like American soil. It's just different, man. We don't have enough glacial shit. I may be in the mountains, Colorado. Did you find that the the aging of the hash had, or what effect did the aging of the hash have on have on it? The age of the the effect of the aging, because there's the aging that they do when it's fresh, and then there's so you, you gotta realize that they're not making the hash for like six, seven months after harvest, right? So that's where they're really doing their off gassing and their stabilization is just on the plant. And what it did was it, I mean, we smoke a lot of hash here, right? It took, it took a lot of the gassy, edgy, which is what Americans like. We like like an aggressive driving high. It turned that down and it brought up these like more cerebral subtleties. And 
it gave you like a 60 40 so 60 percent in the head where you were cool and 40 percent body so your body was comfortable but active and your mind was lit up but not like overly stimulated and someone just asked uh, i just saw it flash across anybody find any gas in the valleys yeah gas is all over the place you find a lot of gas which i call it petroleum and so we found a, a bunch of uh petroleum uh and I saw it though in Afghanistan lines too. So it's not unique. It's just, it's just, does it come with the other things you want? And so, and does it, does it pass that trait on in breeding? So when I took the, the Afghani work I did, I took those into a lot of modern cultivars and I was laying this disgusting, you know, gassy, beady, decaying material male into all these other plants. And it threw that profile on top of the modern sophistication. And what it did was it added a level of potency that was impressive. Like it just, it was almost like fucking too strong where I, 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 I did the breeding. I did the selection. There was a cherry pie Gosney hybrid I did that came out Stella. So I had my son's friend come by who's a washer. He fresh freezes the plant, washes it, and then, and then squishes it and gives it back to me. And I got so friggin' tuned on this shit that I didn't think I had the ability to replace my hot water heater. And I, I went to the garage to get some tools and I was having like this, I was, I was like, and do I have the skills? I used to be a fucking builder, right? So I'm laughing and I know that's too. And I'm sitting there cracking up and I'm like, holy shit, man, I'm tore up. I'm having fucking life, like altering conversations here over the potency. And it was about the delivery. And so what we like is we like that fresh delivery but what I noticed is that Europeans traditionally and in individuals that smoke the consumption, they don't want such a severe stabbing in the eye high. They want to be able to feel good for hours because they're not typically carrying a fucking vape in their hand, puffing all day or smoke. So they smoke in sessions and it would kind of go along with like tea. So they pray five times a day and the, 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 the prayer five times a day really reflects, you know, before sunrise to sunset. And it, it gives you this natural appreciation for your day. And, and those sessions also coincide with tea, which is a break to, to drink. And then there will be smoke. And so the way they approached their lives was in this manner that worked because they've had time to do it. Where for us, like we're trying to get blasted and then go back to our life where they're staying at a level throughout their life. And so what they want, I believe, is, is a more functional, workable high. And I dug it because every time you smoked, and, and I even smoked it in tobacco a couple of times, and I'm not a tobacco smoker. I wanted to play around and see like what was the different matrixes. And I've done it before in, in US and other countries. But when I was there, I'm like, hey, you know, what's, what's your methods? But we were rolling all that weed. I mean, we were rolling cylinders of hash into all these joints. I mean, we we're rolling like four or five gram joints with a with a fucking tooth uh, a tootsie roll of hash in the middle. It was ridiculous. You got you got a, you got five hundred fucking grams of hash to smoke. That's not a little bit of hash. <laughs> so, I mean, we just smoking the living shit out of it, right? And everywhere we met, we met, we would meet another hash maker in a village, and they would bring hash. And then we met another Pakistani dude who owned a mining company. And he was like, bro, I just got back from Morocco. And he had a fat chunk of fresh Moroccan. And so we shaved the Moroccan because it's harder. And we were smoking the Moroccan inside the joint with the weed wrapped in a snake of Tierra Valley hash. So it was like this hash cornucopia. And it was, I felt like a little kid, man. I, I couldn't have been any happier. And 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 me and Numi, the 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 my boy. I was getting an education on the world around me every second we were there. So it was like, you really, you got to feel and understand the history of a region that's timeless. And it made me wish that I could have my friends from there come here so that I can take them on the same experience and show them, show them Humboldt County. Cause I think I love Humboldt as much as they love Pakistan. And it, it made me feel really good about loving your region for its for good and bad, the things that are that are both, you accept it as a total, and and because at the end of the day, it shaped you. And so, me moving to Humboldt in my twenties shaped my whole life, and it 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 created it created me. 
And so for me to be able to say, look, I love this region impacted me so greatly. This is our region. That's kind of what it felt like with the team where you got to really drown in every little detail because each person had their own perspective and their own appreciation. And everyone was, was unbelievably intelligent. Like we pick up this cat, Shem. Shem was a character, right? Shem's dad owned an inn. So we take Shem with us on the trip so that Shem can uh, take us for the tour of the valley, right? And he's saying, me and these, the villagers in this other valley don't get along. We've had like some family beef. And I said, recently, he goes, no, 150 years ago. And it was hella funny because it was like 150 years of like micro tension, but you know, like it was precious, but Shem could understand their language. We go to the next village, Shem can understand their language. I asked Shem, how many languages do they speak? And he says eight. So Shem speaks eight fucking languages fluently and he's like 20. And so, you know, you're hanging out with 20 year olds that are living in the mountains that can speak eight languages. It's really humbling because like for me, I struggle speaking my own language. I can barely speak English. <laughs> That's the only language I know. So to be with people that are able to absorb so much and be able to identify the nuances and the, the, the peculiarities and the components, it was fascinating, man. I've just never been around so many people who love their region so much that they actually took the time to study it and understand it. And when you spent time with them, they gave it to us. I mean, fuck, we were in a park, right? We went to this killer Avery, right? Massive Avery where they let us hold birds and shit. It was, it was epic. And afterwards, we're walking out the door and we see this dude playing this instrument. And it's this old like Afghani instrument, but it, it made me always think of like Kung Fu music, right? Like when I was a kid, I was into Kung Fu theater and that Chinese that that little that little spring it sounded just like it so i was just riveted to it and we got to see a musician play it but then we bump into a, a really old school musician playing it in the park and they invite him to come with us to dinner so that he can play at dinner well he hops in the rig and he hops in the very back and he starts busting that shit out and so we're rolling down the road with this old school traditional pakistani musician and he's playing in the rig and it makes you never want to turn the radio on again. Like in life, it's great to have a live musician rolling with you just playing down. So we all went to dinner. Then we went back to the hotel and he played in the hotel for us. And then the guys greased him up with some loot and took him home. I'm quoting from... Uh, it is. Uh, this is a good question. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good question. Someone's talking about, um, go back to the first one. It was, they want to build on the history, but go go click me back one one slide on that question that you're posting. Because it's about, do, do, do the Pakistanis want to be involved in cannabis like in, in the way we do? And yes, so Saeed had never smoked flour. I mean, he's been making hash since he's three. Never smoked flour. And Danny and him started smoking weed and he was taking bong hits of herb. And he was like, whoa, this is cool. And so at the end of the day, exposing them to products that they really didn't have an ability to have because of the climate, you start to see that, that we're, it's not just we get genes from them and we appreciate their stuff, but it's that we can actually influence them and shape their direction so that what you have is that cross-culturalism, that you should have both products in the world. I call it internal, external markets. There should be internal markets where it's things that you have that are inside, that are from the country, that reflect the country, and then things that get pushed out, and then and vice versa for all countries. So that you're always maintaining your identity of your unique nature, but you're also saying, hey, U.S. has got some killer shit. Let's grow it here and, and let's expose people in Pakistan to it. So I think as you go forward, the, the westernization of Pakistan, Afghanistan, those regions to, to copy and emulate U.S. culture will change the distribution of consumption and you'll see way more flour consumed and you'll see their, uh, their hash and how they make it and their, the, the, the plant selection come to us so that what we have is we have the diversity we need. And I just believe that it just takes time and it also just takes individuals that are willing to work on it. You can't, you know, the fucking government's not going to do shit, but you can, you can create a relationship with individuals in other countries on a friendship level 
And just that alone will help you understand details that you can't get. And you can't get it off the internet because the internet's a freak show. You basically got to do it to where you can talk to somebody in this manner so that no one's afraid to ask questions. On the internet, if you ask a question or if you anything wrong, I mean, you get fucking skewered. So no one wants to, no one wants to really like get into shit deeply because people who can type fast and yell loud kind of dominate. And at the end of the day, that's not necessarily the people who are really the ones you want to work with. When the people you want to work with are people that are good people. And some of them are quiet and some of them are shy and some of them just don't like drama. And so that trifecta of individual doesn't live on anything that's, you know, forum based, internet based. And it's just really about like shows like that. that's why I always love uh, like this is the first time I mean, you get to work together, Jamal. But me and Pete been fucking shooting content for years. And, it, and it's, I always love what he does because he puts out good content and he, he's also always willing to do any kind of content that's charity related or goodwill benefit. And, and he's always doing it in a genuine way. And he, he only reaches out to me, you know, to play around when he says, Hey, could you help me out with something? And, and I always say yes. And anytime I ask him for that same favor, Hey, we want to bring attention to something Pete uses his platform. And so, you know, the, the, the FCP, it does a beautiful job being a, a middle ground for these conversations. And that's why, you know, me and Danny, when we, when we started doing all the media and, and, and Danny's is, he's far more adept at it than I am. Like I'm content, but I'm not someone who creates a lot of media, right? Be, like people film me, interview me. I teach in colleges, but I don't, I'm not a social media wizard. And so how do you like coordinate and collect everybody? And so Dan's sharp. And what he was able to do was, was say, look, I'm going to shoot the content and then we can all participate. And so everybody in the entire group was able to like tag and, and share so that what it did is it brought all of these people that we were involved with forward so that now the public can reach out to them on IG, the public can reach out to them on WhatsApp and be able to say, Hey, I just want to say hi. And, and that's how you start a relationship. It's not about, let me get a hold of your shit. Because that's that's not how you start a relationship. But we figured that if we could get it all out there, it would be great. And 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 because Danny's adept at it and he, he understands, you know, how to move the content in that way, it made it just really easy. And then I gotta give him a shout too, because I was having a nightmare with the friggin' visa. And um, he, he did a great job as an intermediary getting the visa squared away. And then the team uh, went all the way, like drove six hours to get to the embassy to get it straight. And so I just got supported the whole trip in a, in a beautiful way. And at the end of the day, I think that's what we want to do as a return is to say, listen, you got a beautiful country filled with incredible people and you could go there on a vacation or a trip and be just blown away. And don't, don't, don't look at it as it's painted because I mean, I didn't know what to expect either. I just knew that the people I spoke to online were cool. And I take your face value there. And for the most part, it's been pretty accurate for my life. If you're pretty normal over a couple of conversations, you're probably pretty normal. And so I knew that nobody wanted to, to cause any issue. They, they had a dream and it just allowed us to go have that same dream with them. And for me, man, I've been having this dream since I was 12 to go to these places and see the birth of the herb. That's amazing. And yeah, I finally got to do it and I'm 57. So it's just like, it's pretty, it's pretty poignant to me. And at the end of the day, you know, we just want to shine light on the team and and let the world know that you got, you know, some incredible gene collectors uh, that are land race genetics that absolutely know what the fuck they're doing. There's no question. And so for me to work with them was an honor. And I got an education. And, you know, usually I'm spitting education. This time I got an education and I was grateful for it. And I I just had this wonderful experience in Pakistan that just and it made me grateful to be home too, because it made me realize how much I love my home and it made me realize how much I love my friends. And so it was beautiful. It wasn't like a comparison contrast. It was just the polish, it kind of polished off the rough edges and made some better light shine like a stone. When you polish it, the light shines better. That's amazing. That's, that's sounds like what we all hope to get out of going on vacations. Um, Khalid, would you like to, to, I mean, I would love to get you involved. Are you you're somewhere on the other side of the pond. Is that You're on mute, brother.
Can you uh, unmute? Click unmute. I think he's good. I think you're good. You got him? Khalid? Khalid, can we hear you? No, muted? Muted or, or, or connection, because like you said, you're on the other side of the earth. I see, I see. Um, who, I mean, I guess, you know, we're, we're kind of wrapping up, but, uh, I, I, you know, what was your, who, who was your team? You mean like, are you asking me or, or, uh, or Khalid? Um, either, either one of you, I, I don't think. Oh shit. Like the team, well, the team that traveled, the team that traveled was, was, you know, Danny, John and Rolf and then Neil, Imran and Jamie and me, we were the internationals. And then Land Race Genetics is is uh, Numi, Hami, and 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 Kali. Those are the three brothers. So they form Land Race. Uh, Let's be friends. Pakistan was uh, Newman and Usman. And then you had um, a, a bunch of friends that came with, and that would have been uh, Salamat and uh, uh, SBR. Which I have. A, I, you know, it's you know, it's terrible when you're from Rhode Island. You just fuck people's names up brutally. <laughs> oh man, like it's it's brutal. And when I hang out with my Polynesian friends, they crack up because their whole fucking world is vowels, which I can't really pronounce well. So I just chew this shit. I spit it out. Thank God they forgive me. But um, I call them the, I call them the the, the architect twins because one of them was the instructor, one of them was a student. But they're just lovely guys, just absolute plethoras of knowledge. Oh, Imran was in that team too. Imran was was part of the uh, uh, internationals. You had. Uh, a couple of guys that were just rolling with as like friends. And so you had the photographers and the other drivers, but all the men were just good men and they were friends. They were there to like support and travel. You had, and you had Mushy, Mushy, who was hysterical. Uh, Mushy is the funniest dude you ever hung out with in your life. This guy's got a sense of humor, make you piss your pants. And so like when you're, when you're traveling with cats like this and you're all, you're all trying to, to be able to, create a better world because like I said, I'm older. And so most of the guys are all younger than me by a chunk. And what they want is they want to build their legacy. They want to be able to take their country and push it forward in a positive way, both through, you know, team land races through the genetics to bring attention to the genes and then also develop relationships with the farm. So the farmers benefit financially from the work. So you're creating this, this circular system, which is regenerative life. And then for the Let's Be Friends Pakistan, they want to be able to say, listen, man, Pakistan's a stunning place and people should not be afraid to come here because if you do, you're going to get a level of treatment and camaraderie that's just going to shock you. And you can fly into Lahore, you can, uh, you can fly into Islamabad, you can fly into any of these regions. And so it's only a couple hour drive into the Hunza. And you're able to spend time in a place that the oldest people in the world live in. Eat there for a week and you'll understand what I'm saying. Hi. You trip me out. Hi. You saying hi? Yes. Hang on. I want to say, say hi. There you go. Nice. Hello. There you go. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. You, want, you want video now too? Yes. Good. Oh, I just okay. see. You're seeing? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm outside. You want to go outside? No, the zombie is. Oh, there's a zombie outside. There's a zombie outside. Oh, no, be careful. Be careful of the zombies. <laughs> I said the sharp teeth. Yep, they got the sharp teeth too, huh? They get you. See, I scratched my nose. Don't you scratch your nose? Here, stick your finger in my nose. This has been a, an excellent show. We've had, I think, three or four kids come on, which is. Gotta be a record, I think. Yeah, think yeah, no, we all got little ones, man. It's a game. Yeah. Dad it's a life. We just but it was, it up was an epic basketball game. They nice, lost how'd they 20 do? Twenty to eighteen. Nice. Oh. Well, not so nice, but. Oh, you lost on that. Hey, it's close yeah. though. You know, it's it's a good fight. That's the main point. <laughs> good. No, it's been it's been a blast, man. I'm, I'm grateful you invited me onto the show, and I just want to thank everybody that came on and listened to us ramble about this adventure, and hopefully, um. People get some benefit out of both sides, man. Hopefully people in Pakistan get to make some connections with uh, other individuals outside and people from other regions get to make friendships there. It Don't, don't let it slip through your fingers. The, 
the world is huge, man. Cannabis is a nice thread. It seems to tie a lot of shit together pretty well. And so I'm grateful for what it's done for my life. And I'm grateful that it's allowed me to meet so many beautiful people. And I just hope uh, that the listeners get a chance to experience this on their own. And then they we, we get to chop it up. But uh, I can't wait to get some of the genes out in the world and uh, pay attention. Land Race Genetics will be doing their 2023 release. And I'm going to um, like do the promo on it just so I can explain what they collected and, and some of the work. So we'll all get that out there pretty soon. And, and I'm not part of that brand. It's just that it's... Um, it's a thank you from me to them for, for taking the time to educate me on the culture and on, on their um, hunting methodologies and to take me through the populations of cannabis and let me experience it with locals in a way that was just absolutely awesome. And I can't say enough. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Um, thank you, Khalid, for coming on, even though it was very brief. I, I really appreciate appreciate that. Peter, thank you for organizing the show. And most of all, thank you to the listeners. And I'll just leave it with um, a quote from you, Kevin, which you said is the culture steers the herb. And I thought that was extremely poignant. Um, thank you for taking the time. Everybody have a beautiful day. Awesome. Later, all. Take care, brother. Has it stopped? Hit that end button. Glitchy. No, I, I am. It's just like my computer is old. I need to <laughs> invest in a new one. I've been having. Would you it. like me to hit the end button? <laughs> uh, hold on, here we go.